Hello? Is anyone out there? I wonder, have you heard the tale? The one about the Dub Talk podcast? Well, when you travel to their podcast, you will find 12 spirits together talking about English dubs. But you should be careful when you approach them. Why? Because they will speak in words that are not suitable for the living, all the while spoiling you on what you cannot see. And while they share varying opinions, no two are alike. However, if you fail to listen, then you will never be heard from again. In order to survive, listen to today's story and enjoy. Greetings, one and all, and welcome to Dub Talk, the podcast where we discuss the latest and greatest in English dubs. I am the seventh of the seven wonders, Stephanie of the Bathroom, and tonight I am joined by other wonders who wish to give you a little fright. We have number five, the four o'clock library, Amon. I'm going to steal your books when you're not looking, and then read them. You'll never get them back. We have number four, no a clue of the art room. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I want to go along with the bit, but I'm just jealous that Amon got to be the library because... Did, did you see that library? That library is super awesome. I wanted to be the library instead. Too we bad, Noah. This. I know. <laughs> Look here. At least you got a good one, too. I did, too. You didn't lie. I, you said at the top because, of the recording. Yes. Because lastly... We have number two, known as the Misaki Stairs, Andrew. I wish somebody would cut my hair like that. It's grown quite long. <laughs> I can't even hold it now. <laughs> oh, y'all ruined it. <sighs> I, I was going to try and go with it, but it was just like, uh, Misaki Stairs, Misaki Stairs. Um, I need an arm and a leg. And then I thought of scissors. It's like, damn, I do need a haircut, don't I? I should take care of this. <laughs> Legit though, Noah, I had to do yeah. mini research for this. Be that is actually one of the wonders that's in the original manga. Mm. Okay. Is some is um something of the art room. That is. I can't remember the actual name, but it is legit part of the manga. Anyway. I I fully expect that to uh, to go all uh, Akiyuki Shinbo when it finally gets adapted. You know, like full out seizure moment with the art world. <laughs> oh, seizure moment. Oh no. <laughs> <coughs> Together, the four of us are here to tell you spooky stories and rumors of famed apparitions that will chill you to the bone. Today, we will be discussing the Winter 2020 anime series from director Masaomi Ando and Lurche Studio, Toilet Bound Hanako-kun. If you are unfamiliar with this haunting tale, here's a quick summary. Kamome Academy is famous for its rumors regarding the seven mysteries and supernatural occurrences. Nene Yashiro, a first-year high school student who loves the occult and wishes for a boyfriend, summons the seventh and most famous mystery, Hanako-san of the Toilet, a girl who allegedly haunts the bathroom and can grant wishes for the right price. Upon summoning her, Yashiro discovers that Hanako-san is nothing like the rumors say. Hanako is a boy. With a turn of events, she is spiritually bound to Hanako and becomes his assistant, helping him destroy evil, supernatural, and change rumors in order to maintain the balance between the spirit world and the human world. Along the way, Yashido learns about her connection to the spirit world and the dark secrets regarding Hanako and his past. And maybe along the way, just, you know, kind of mess with the, uh, the spirit hunters who are really, really incompetent at their job. You mean the exorcists? I am going to eradicate you. What do you mean you put a seal on my staff? See, see, that's just oh. Ko. <laughs> we haven't seen Teru in action really yet, so we can't really oh, I, I, say they're all incompetent. You say right? that. No, no, no. I have seen Teru in action. I have read the doujin, and trust me, he is. Please step on me, senpai. And I am. That is more than enough. I don't need to see that animated. The, what they drew on the fan manga is all you need to see. Trust me. Oh, sweet, sweet fucking lore. This is going to be a hell of a night. 
<laughs> oh, Noah, when was the last time I did an episode with you, I'm realizing? Not only has it been a while since we've done an episode together, but it's been a while since I've done an episode. I think the last one I did was uh, back when we did Handshakers, which was over a month ago by this point. And you and I and haven't, we la- haven't done an episode since the, the time who leapt through girls. This is true. And then freaking Alma and Andrew and I just recorded something last week. <laughs> but it's always, it's always good to record things with you guys, too. It's a fun time. Y'all are fun people. I like a keg again. Oh, you. no, I didn't record something with Amon last week. What the hell am I thinking? I meant Jet. <laughs> but I did record something with Amon a few weeks back, so close. Um, Andrew, would you say that you are uh, that recording with us is so fun that you would uh, take the form of a mini demon and steal things for us? I'd get a bokeh. I'd, I'd turn into a moke. Would, That'd be fun. I would, I would hug you a moke. Moke are adorable. Be, All right. be our go for Andrew. Hug- they are, they are just the peeps of this world, and they were probably designed to be <laughs> sold as such. You're wrong! <laughs> Fuck! I would hug a moke like I would hug that Maromi bot, like, pillow plush thing that the Funimation is doing. Thank you for answering my prayers on that you, one. You, he- you heard it here. You heard it here, Andrew. You get your girlfriend a ducky mockery for Christmas. No! I have... Fuck you! Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna be honest. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to think of good jokes to juggle with to, to get <clears throat> off with where we're going here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Mm-hmm. you're looking for jokes to get off? No, to get off the ground because he's floating like a ghost. Uh, I I need to salvage this before this gets any worse. Anyway. Cap- Cap- Capitalized this- podcast had rails. I miss the rails. They were nice. I miss the rails. Look, there's some rails. Let's use them. Yay! Yes, please, please, let's use these rails and let's not let Noah and Andrew fly off of them tonight. Right, I, I <laughs> promise the rails and hold on for dear life. We're going in hard. Yes. Anyways. So yeah, th- <laughs> this show, which, which I, I just want to say before we go on that uh, I had no idea what this show was about going into it. I you went, went into this completely blind. Completely blind. But just I knew a lot of people were were talking about watching it. And recommending it, but no one was really mm-hmm. saying about what it was, like what the pre- what the premise or even the genre was. And by the title, I had assumed it was like some uh, wacky Jintama style comedy. It, it's no. not. It is not that at all. I mean, it can be a little bit wacky comedy, but it's not, it's not Jintama wacky. <laughs> no, it's no, that Jintama no. Wacky. I wouldn't put no. this in the comedy section. This is this is firmly in uh, in Lurch's. Um, a wheelhouse of things like Assassination Classroom, where it's mostly lighthearted comedy with some heavy drama sprinkled in. I'll, I'll, 100%. I'll also say, talking about the actual anime itself, this is directed by, like, the director, I think, is the best one at uh, Lerche. Uh, mm-hmm. Specifically, they've done the likes of School Live, Scum's Wish, and Astra mm. Lost in yep. Space. So, yep. I think when it comes to adapting manga in particularly... This director's got a really good idea of adapting the exact vibe that the manga needs to be made into anime. And I think the tone of this one is basically kinda eerie ghost stories with a little bit of, like, gag manga thrown into the mix. And I think Mm -hmm. both aspects are nailed perfectly in regards to the tone of what this series is trying to be. Just since, since the conversation was kind of started, Noah went into this blind. I know Andrew and I, we were basically following the show when it was airing and until production was halted on the dub. Amon, was this a blind one for you? or? I mean, I'm, I am broadly familiar with the original Hanaka-san urban legend thing. Right. Uh, and I vaguely knew, I mean, I knew it was about a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> and every, everyone kind of looks like a doll, which I find very charming. But otherwise uh, than that, you knew nothing about it. Ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's spooks. It's spooks. I mean, Ferris, if you want to sell me on a show, just write. You just hey, what's the show about? Ghosts. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Let's see. Ghosts. Uh, kaiju. Weird, obscure shit. Uh, skeletons. Oh hell yeah! Does it have skeletons? Skeletons. There, there's which, Amon's wheelhouse right there. <laughs> which is, which is why we are going to have Amon on our next episode, which is called Casper Goes to the Rothbury. God damn it. I. Anyways. Okay. <laughs> anyways, we've been at this shit for long enough. So, as always, raining it back in. We're going to be discussing the English dub in full from production to casting and to performance and with everything in between. I hope you're ready to be scared. Fair warning, you'll need to sleep with a nightlight once you hear this tale. All right. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh.
Ooh, a boy in the girl's bathroom. Ooh, that that actually is the name of a book. That the... I mean, I think I remember that one. Yeah, that was, that was by uh, by Louis Sicard, the the guy who wrote Holes in the Wayside Story books. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, let's get started with our ADR staff and holy sweet baby Jesus, is this a massive one? <laughs> um, so we have our ADR director, we have three assistant directors for individual episodes. Um, we also have a main writer and while the credit is not listed, this, there's another confirmed writer who at least did one episode. Um, of the show, so we're going to briefly talk about him as well. For our ADR director, we have Miss Jade Saxon, who has directed other series such as The Helpful Fox Senkosan, Kakuryo Bed and Breakfast for Spirits, and Zombieland Saga. For our three assistant directors, for our uh, directors for episode five, we have two of them. One is Jamie Markey, the other is Megan Shipman. Jamie Markey has directed other, has assistant directed other series such as Nekopara and Yuri Kuma Arashi, while Megan Shipman has been the assistant ADR director for other series such as Astra Lost in Space, No Guns Life, and Radiant Season 2. As for Episode 7, uh, Morgan LeRae served as the assistant director for this. She has also been the assistant director for Astra Lost in Space, Endro, and Farigon. As for writers, our lead writer on this is Leah Clark. She has written other shows such as Azure Lane, Kamisama Kiss, and Space Battleship Tiramisu. And as for one of our assistant writers, um, it was confirmed which episode specifically, but unfortunately, I can't remember because he stated this in a feature during, during Funimation Con back in July. This would be Aaron Dismuke. He has also written scripts for Hakata Tonkotsu Ramens, It Invaded, and Tokyo Ghoul. No, you're very chatty. Why don't you give us a give us a little bit of a start of what your thoughts on the directing and writing are? This is going to be interesting because this is the first time that I've been on an episode where we talked about a episode that was or, um, a series that was mostly recorded in quarantine. I know that we've already covered a couple series already on this podcast that are like that. So if I understand correctly, the split up between um, the directing jobs between Jade and the three others is kind of a result of taking advantage of people's availability during the quarantine. Is that correct? No. That is incorrect. Ah. So production of the English dub actually stopped at episode eight. Okay, so the- Episode eight was completed, the- and then that was when quarantine kicked in, and then they had to do the rest at home. And then okay. I think the rest the of the dub came, came out in July, August, around that range. So it so wasn't there, even, I could pull they didn't come the, back to it for a few months. Hang on, I could pull up the dub from home article so I could tell you. Exactly. While, while, you're look, while you're looking for well, that, Noah, continue. Well, the, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't going to, um, yeah, I didn't want to speculate without getting confirmation. Uh, but no, yeah. The, um, the good thing is that um, even with that uh, brief gap between uh, one through eight and the final episodes, it's, in, it's a very consistently directed dub. And mm-hmm. like Alman was saying, this is a kind of a difficult tone to get right. You've got these very dark, gory, violent rumors of things going on in an occultish, haunting setting with the art style to go with it. But people are still cracking jokes about their weird earrings or uh, weird puns about um, people's uh, <laughs> living in a bathroom. Earring. There's, I love, I love so much all of the little lines that, um, uh, uh, what's his name, that Ko throws out every episode. It's like, there's this long list of, what are... Things that I can call Hanako. Yes. And I'm just going to list a different one every single episode. Pl- yes. Plunger pants. Or I, I, that's just one I wrote down. There's a bunch of them. Yeah. And, and it's j- it is so funny to listen to that. Oh, because- I, have a, I, have, I have another fun one for you. Pull turd geist. Oh, ah. I didn't even remember pull turd geist. That was from episode three. They when go so I think we're first introduced to him. They go so fast that, yeah, you have to, you have to write them down, but they are so funny. Yep. Also. And uh, that, that's a uh, definitely a props to Leah for her writing, which I didn't even write down, like, complete sentences on thoughts on Leah's writing. I just wrote down my favorite little one-liners, like, yep. you dirty... I wrote down some of my favorites, too. You, okay, episode one, you dirty daikon. Epi- <laughs> episode two, if it comes between me cleaning the bathroom or signing papers all by myself, hand me all the stacks. <laughs> episode three... Uh, Kyo comes up and says, That's total bullsh... Nonsense! 
<laughs> yep. Little, just so li little lines like that make this a lot of fun to listen to. And it takes some of the edge off of the heavier moments. Um, and that also is why Jay did a really good job on directing this. Because the best parts of the dub, like where it really shines and you get to kind of appreciate how much fun it is to listen to really good voice actors are the underplayed moments where they kind of realize the absurdity of what's going on around them and you get like uh, coy little bits like uh, Hanako uh, confessing his deepest darkest secret I really like donuts yep. who doesn't buddy <laughs> who doesn't who doesn't by the way it really likes it really likes to walk the fine line between those lighthearted comedic moments and the darker, more dramatic and serious moments. And it actually walks that line rather well. Yeah, and the, uh, it's, there's a lot of sincerity in this. And mm -hmm. again, that was in the original Japanese, but the English cast definitely played up the sincere portions of it. They, they didn't turn it into a mm -hmm. farce, like, a, like you didn't turn it into a ghost stories kind of scenario, even though they easily could have. And I really appreciate that. So uh, yeah, all the direction on this is really well. And the cast is, I love it when I can say this. They sounded like they were having fun. No, oh, yeah. I can't always say... I don't know if you guys can agree or not, but I cannot always say that. Um, and sometimes it's just because the show itself is either, like, lower tier or it's more serious, and so you don't get to have a lot of fun with it. But in this one, they, you could, like, hear them having fun with their lines yeah. and their, like, almost ad-libbing on the dialogue in the booth. That's that's a treat. In this business where we're cranking out simul dubs and going into backlogs to, you know, do shows that haven't been dubbed yet and movies while doing commercials on the side, it is a treat to be able to say, these voice actors sound like they're having fun and I am so glad that I get to listen to this. Oh, 100%. I can agree with that. They have, they, they were having fun with this show. <laughs> they were. <laughs> Even when the last third of it was under, like, unfortunate circumstances in terms of production. Oh, I finally, got a, I, I finally got a good segue. Um, it The dub episode 9 was the first one that was released uh, that was the, done from the home. The Tea Party episode. Yes, that was released uh, Thursday, June 18th of 2020. Okay, and so then the, between and then the rest of, March and June, basically. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of, the, so the rest of them, 10 through 12, dropped mid to late July. Which I just, okay. want, I just want to say that if anyone out there was upset about having to wait for the final episodes, y'all were not around for the final episode of Blood Blockade Battlefront. That's all I'm saying. Oh, God. Oh, my God. You people that are was spoiled. Why are you reminding me? Because that's the, I don't know if there's anything worse than that uh, in the that simul dub age, but that... Uh, not that not say pain. It wasn't anyone's fault. I, like, we're not going to blame anyone. I'm just no, saying. No, 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 no. That was all production stuff. That was, yeah, that was, produ that was production malarkey that obviously unfortunate circumstances. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was pain. <laughs> I mean, at least with all the pandemic horseshit, we knew the expectation of things being delayed. <laughs> so it was for people who are actually patient with this kind of shit. Mm -hmm. We were able to like be patient and wait for it and things like that. Blood blockade. Oh my god, uh, I forgot that happened. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's a good. That's good. I'm. I'm oh. Andrew, since you spoke up for a hot second, why don't you kind of jump in here with us? All right, so I'll say this. I will say the direction of this show is strong, for sure. Mm -hmm. Jade Saxton is a director I've, over the pretty much the entire course I've known her work, was, I think, near the early days of Dub Talk 2, now I think about it. Like, she, she started kind of around the time we were really getting into full gear, and... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've gotten really confident in her work as a ADR director. 100%. Like, I see her attached to a project, and like there are some directors where it's like, okay, this won't all. This is, pr this could be pretty good, but there's always that slight chance. I feel like anytime I see Jade attached to something now, it's like, okay, yeah, this is probably gonna be pretty. Listen, good. she did the impossible and made. Um... Why am I blanking on the name? I think I go down her list. Token Rambu Hanamaru. Okay, okay, I was like, okay. A thing that existed. And that was like, that was like. <laughs> she one of her... can work magic, and that was one of probably her earlier yeah, ones. Yeah, which is still amazing to me. Uh, but yes. yeah, no, it's like I've gotten a lot of faith in uh, Jade's catalog of work. So seeing her attached to this, I'm like, okay, this is probably gonna be pretty good. And all in all, I will say that the voice direction and even a lot of the sound design attached to this is really mm. good because you've got a lot of the old-timey creepy radio stuff and you got the tone of things <laughs> being a little eerie and sometimes a little wacky and i think yep. the tone is set really good the fact that you've got kind of like slapstick four coma comedy and 
kind of eerie, supernatural, like, life and death stuff. I think... I don't think the show always meshes it perfectly, but I think the tone of the dub especially is nailed perfectly. And I think a lot of the deliveries are especially particularly fun, courtesy of Jade and the ensemble's direction. Liz? The, uh, the, uh, the, the tone portion of it is that it wants you to feel like these people are in danger at some times, like they could actually die. And in watching this, and I don't really get the feeling that anyone actually is in danger of dying. At least no one who's already dead. They could be more dead. It's true. It feels more like the kind of show where it's not about dying, it's about fates that are worse than death. I, yeah, mm. like... like, like will, will they find out about my diary? Leah's script is pretty good for the most part. And there's definitely a bit of, like, funny quips and spice thrown into the mix. I don't think it always lands. I think... Really? Okay. I think there's a couple of times Ko says... I like a lot of the... the... the bathroom quips. Mm -hmm. I like a lot of the bathroom quips that he says okay. that's Hanako's expense, because I think that's kind of like a cute little running gag thing, and it does make sense mm -hmm. that he would like be calling him, like, toilet breath or plunger head or whatever. I think there's a yeah. couple of times in his casual, sometimes serious dialogue... Where it comes off a little harder in the bro angle than I think the scene sometimes mm. calls for. Gotcha. Okay, I can I can see what you're like. Saying. It's it's not like jarring, but there's been a couple of times where it felt like some of the drama or some of the casualness of the scene got taken out. Like moody AF was something I remember was. Dropped. Oh yeah. I was like mm. talking, yep. telling Matsuba. Yeah, because that's supposed to be a more serious moment. Like, I'm going to make you feel remembered, and I'm going to do that by referring to you as Moody AF. Like, mm, there, okay. there was other things that came to mind, but there was just a couple of times I felt some of Ko's script deliveries came off a little on the stronger end than I think were particularly necessary for the scene. Interesting. Now, okay. it, it is interesting you say that because that um, his character is actually a well-worn trope in uh, high school anime like this. The third mm. wheel or the other yes. main guy. You can look at anything from My Bride is a Mermaid to any Kyoani key like, adaptation. Like, legit, Ko is the third main character of this show. The two main characters are clearly Nene and Hanako, mm -hmm. but... Ko is the third lead character in a sense. And, but, that. but that character does not always get a lot of development. A lot of times, right. um, at least uh, in the 2000s, it, it's evolved a little bit since then, but they're mostly just for comic relief. They're not supposed mm -hmm. to get development. They're, they're supposed to be the star scream of the series. So the fact that they <laughs> actually <laughs> give... <laughs> They actually give this character. I, mean, I can't believe that comparison happened. A little they, bit oh, more. Jesus. No, no, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't recall this character quite being quite that backstabby. This is true. He's not that backstabby. No, that's and true. If it would Stars... be anyone potentially, that like, would be his brother, Terror. Like Star Star like, Starscream never made donuts. Every time Megatron like has a cough or something, Starscream throws a coup. That's true. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure, I'd love to live in the, the see no the al wrong. see the alternative show where Star Scream did make donuts for the cast that, just just because oh, it's shit. not like I like you or anything. I mean, he he, <laughs> he would do that, but it'd be part of a larger plot to take control. Yes. Wow. Ah, <laughs> yes. For personal Lord gain. Megatron has taken my handmade donuts, which are filled with anti-energon energy, which will suck his life force <laughs> dry, and I will become the new leader of the Decepticons. <laughs> <laughs> the michael bay movies that i would have watched the hell out of that you know i would have loved that shit come on michael bay what's wrong with you go a lot of things also true but go on a very quick soap box and say you should watch transformers animated that was a really good cartoon and starscream and that is spongebob that is true oh my god you're not you're serious yeah. They, oh yeah, Kenny plays well, yeah. Tom Kenny. In it. what the fuck well, tom kenny's in a lot of stuff he can do more than just the spongebob voice I know Tom Kenny's in a lot of stuff. I just didn't also know he was fucking Starscream. You can also watch some of the newer Transformers cartoons where Jason Marnoka is Megatron, and he's got the voice for Megatron, that's for sure. You know, I can hear it. I can hear it, and I like the idea. <laughs> are, are Bring it back around thoughts? to this. Any any other thoughts right uh, now, Andrew? Voice direction is very good for the tones that the show is pulling off. The script is also strong and has some really good, like, 
quips and little things here and there. It does a good job to do drama and comedy, though I don't think every every particular quip of Ko was always necessary for the scene. Okay. That, that's my All main right. thing. Amon, do you have anything to add? Uh, it good. <laughs> it good. <laughs> Brilliant! Short answer? Put that on That's the back of the box. Um, <laughs> it 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 good dub talk podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it good. Look, you, look, <laughs> I'm on look, dual. You, are you, are you telling me that you wouldn't you wouldn't see that on the shelf of a show you didn't know if you didn't see that quote and you wouldn't think, well, I gotta know what the hell this is now. <laughs> look, Dep- look, depends on the show. Look, I'm, if it's I'm a serious drama, no. If it's a Ninja Slayer, the animation, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we joke, but, like, I'm all for more dub talk quotes being used on promotional material. We're on Coach of Sound's website, after all. Yeah, it's true. Uh, <laughs> which, 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 God bless. My, my... Life but, goals. Uh, God bless Coach of Sound. Anyway. Uh, but to be, to, to give more, to get, say more than two words. Uh, <laughs> because despite being from New England, I'm not Calvin Coolidge. Um, <laughs> it's for the best way. <laughs> Of all, of all the presidents, you could have you could have spiked. That's the one you had to go with. Silent Cal. He was famously very terse. He was. You're right. I mean, there's. Oh god. I didn't. I didn't anyway. know he was from New England. Is the thing. All yeah. No. There's. There's New a, England. A, Shut up, Andrew. Andrew. Most of them are from the south. Most of them are from. <laughs> Anyways, oh, the, let's get rails. Um. <laughs> rails. We need to get back on them. There was a. I like this a lot. It was I thought it, the direction was really good. I thought the casting was extremely solid. Uh, this it was just a lot of fun to listen to. I agree with Noah. You can tell that the people recording this had a blast doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is clearly just. It looked like it was a hoot to work on. Uh, I like the writing. I think it does a good job of being punchy and funny without being distracting. It even manages to pull that trick of using a slang that should be really awkward, but manages to not be. The one that uh, springs <laughs> to mind is when uh, the other the other obnoxious third wheel cl- calls uh, calls Nene. It's like you know, dating little snacks like you, and it's like that is the correct <laughs> level of obnoxiousness. <laughs> yes, uh, A plus. Oh, oh god, a yeah. Plus. I, I, I wrote I wrote that down as a line. Sweet little snacks. I'm like, god damn it. It's like, I know I know everything I need to know about this character right now. That is some efficient <laughs> screenwriting. Good job. It's like, bravo. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, this is, cool. this, is, this is just a lot of fun to watch and listen to. Uh, this, is, this is just kind of a fun show because it does do that, um, you know, lighthearted comedy with drama thing that isn't, you know, inc- you know, super rare in anime, but I feel like it's not the norm, or at least not these days. I also really like right. the uh, art design of the show a lot. I think it's really fun to look at. Uh, and it's nice being able to do that without keeping track of subtitles, because there's a lot of fun stuff going on visually here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's nice to just be able to appreciate all that and also enjoy the story, and you don't have to keep track of too much if you don't want to. That, that's oh. another strength of it is that um, going into it as someone who doesn't know too many Japanese folktales or uh, yeah any of their um, mythology, you don't need it to go into this. You can you can watch right. it pretty much blind. I mean that's basically what Aoi is there for is to be the exposition. She's the audience surrogate. Aoi and, uh... No no she's the. Um, let me explain to you, random bystander. Oh no bystander. Aoi, sorry I'm thinking Nene. Nene is the audience surrogate. My bad. I was, right I was right. No. Either Aoi or specifically the girl on the over the radio, whose name escapes me now. Sakura. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and that that yeah that's a, a strong point of it. Although uh, if. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Amon, but you said that this is actually... Hanako is an actual uh, Japanese uh, folktale, is that correct? I'd probably, call, mm-hmm. I'd probably call it an urban legend more than a folktale. Yeah. I think it's a little more recent than that, but a yeah, that's, the, a, okay. that's a thing. A lot of these stories in the show are more like urban legends rather than folktales. That's the better description for them. Yeah, I was watching... More- yeah, they're more, they're more, they're more the ki- you know, they're more the calls coming from inside the house than anything kind of like right. get, classic gotcha. and old timey. Okay, I was watching um, uh, Magia Record, the Madoka Magica spinoff, and there was an mm-hmm. episode where they, all, the whole episode is devoted to nothing but urban legends, basically. And it was kind of hard to tell, like, all right, which one of these are they pulling out of their ass, and which ones of these are, like, common things that have been around since, like, the, the holic days. 
Uh, mm-hmm. to, to be honest, I've, st- I've started watching a YouTube channel that initially focuses on creepypastas, but it also kind of looks at, like, urban legends that started on Nichon. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, okay. And there's a lot of these. I had not yeah, appreciated that's... that. You might have to introduce me to this channel, because now I have to know about it. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I'd be right up your alley. I'll, I'll tell you after we're done recording. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, yeah can... not... I will marathon everything, even though I have to get up early in the morning to do... Car shit. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I I am not an expert by any means, but I think a lot of what they're drawing from are at least rooted in like commonly known urban legends. Obviously, as right. you can see with Hanako Kun, often they're not exactly the same, um, right. but I think kind of at least the root idea is what they're riffing on. Mm-hmm. So, or at least stuff that feels like it could be real. Mm-hmm. So again, okay. it adds like a little, it adds extra dimension where like you can enjoy this completely blind, but mm-hmm. if you're a little more familiar with it, you're like, oh, I, I recognize this, and this is a little treat for me too. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. I, I feel like I feel like I feel like I'd be interested to know what's like watching it as like say a Japanese person who would recognize a lot more of these. It's like, oh, I remember hearing about that in high school. Yeah, yeah, it, that, it, that was a thing at to, my school too. To Noah's point, it, it is like because again, Noah basically went in completely blind, not knowing a damn thing. Whereas Amon at least knew some of the urban legends that are entailed in the show. Like, they also make a point in the show about how rumors affect how these apparitions and wonders do things, you know? Yeah, there's so it, th- there's evolution like, to the rumors. Yep. And if someone creates a rumor that's very, very bad, they can the apparitions can get very dangerous and stuff. So it's it's very interesting how it kind of evolves and it's in its own way, it's like it's like a little bit of a new take on these urban stories and how rumors and misinterpretations can also skew them a bit. Hey. It's it's actually really interesting. I don't have a ton a ton more to add to that. I'm I think I'm mostly gonna agree with what Noah and Amon are saying. Um, I really love the direction of the show. The casting is so much fun with performances in roles that you I normally wouldn't suspect. Like I have never heard this actor do something like Hanako, for instance. I have never heard this actor do something like Ko Minamoto, for instance. Oh. So <laughs> it's so much fun, and it's very diverse, and it might it, it seems like a lot of fun, but for some actors, maybe a little bit of a challenge and something different, which I appreciate 100%. And yeah, I really have been, I fall in love and become more confident and happy with the dubs that Jade directs, 100%. Um, I mean, after Token Rambo Hanamaru, the probably one of the more impossible doves because of like what 40, 50 plus male actors, I like think it was 60. Sh- male to female actors, whatever the number is. So many people playing like 40, like 40, 50, 60 freaking male characters. Like holy goddamn shit! Um, I believe in anything. <laughs> the script. I'm mostly gonna agree with Amon and. No, on this one. While I do understand some of the minor issues that you had, Andrew, on it, I also didn't feel that way, particularly with Ko's dialogue. Um, if anything, how this is done is similar to, if my thoughts wise, is similar to Okami-san, where the dialogue is fun, it's punchy, it's very comedic. It also doesn't go too hammy because you can easily go very, very hammy on it. Oh, one and it also, one character you know, in Okami-san goes a little hammy. Look, <laughs> but she's allowed to be. Shush. But um, at the same time, it also when it's time for those serious and darker moments, it doesn't go the route of hammy punchy dialogue Mm. in order to detract it from that moment which i 100 percent appreciate because this show can go very dark very quickly Mm -hmm. because it deals with a lot of different things with like with um rumors and memories and death there's one character in particular that's plays probably a major role um in in this as well as part of a major character arc for one of our I'm gonna say one of our three leads because there's three leads I guess you can say Mm -hmm. um but and it's just very very that arc in particular oh my god episode eight I was done (laughs) they did not prepare any of us for that no I was I watched it the first time cried like a baby I watched it again today cried like a baby <laughs> like you, you you can't prepare it knows how to give you a, a big old gut punch in the feels it 100 does and it is able to do that 
Um, so that's 100% a credit to the writing that primarily Leah Clark had done. And, oh, this is such a fun show and I love the pieces. And please, Japan, give us a season two. Because <laughs> I want more. Um, <clears throat> I think we're good to move on at this point. Yes? Yes. Yes. All right, so our first set of characters, they are kind of mi some of the minor characters uh, in the show, but they do at least play a decent-sized role. <laughs> we have Aoi Akane, and we have Teru Minamoto. Aoi is Nene Yashido's best friend. She is Nene's usual main source for stories and the rumors regarding the different uh, wonders as well as the apparitions. As for Teru Minamoto, he is Ko Minamoto's older brother. Uh, he is a second year, I believe, in high school. Nene's a first year. And uh, at first, Nene has a crush on him, and it's because of that crush on him that she, she tries to get Hanako to help her. That she's in this mess. Yep. <laughs> Teru Minamoto is the reason why T Nene's in this fucking Th mess. Through no fault of her own. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Look, boy. The bitch it, gets it, herself it, into trouble so much. It's all her fault. For her. <laughs> it's so much her fault. But... Um, what we do find out for with Teru as well as Ko, uh, both of them come from a family line of exorcists, the Minamoto clan. Um, and Teru is, when he's not the nice, sweet student council president that everyone loves and, and bonds over, he gets very, very dark and serious and just wants to get rid of all of the apparitions. But he's, for the time being, he's letting Ko handle the ones that are at the school. Um, but, however big of a role he has in the future, who's to say? Uh, the voice of Aoi Akane is Emily Neves, who has played characters such as Eri in My Hero Academia, Kyoko Sonnen in Dime a Dollar, uh, <laughs> something versus Penguin Empire. I Penguin Dicks. Title. Penguin Dicks the series. <laughs> I knew Noah would appreciate that. As well as Aoi Subaki and Kakadeo Ben Breakfast for Spirits. As for Teru Minamoto, we have David Matranga, mm -hmm. who has played characters such as Bertolt Hoover in the Attack on Titan franchise, Wolfron Lowe in Farigon, and Akari in Carnival. Uh, let's let's kick this off with Amon. What are your thoughts on these performances? Uh, they were nice, and I don't remember these characters very well. <laughs> <laughs> Shit! All right, yeah. Uh, like, that's actually fitting they, since they, they, one of them I, disappears in episode three. <laughs> I, 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 I could, these look like characters who probably show up pretty consistently, but I think just as of the stuff that's been adapted in season one. Right. I mean, there's a reason they're in the first group. They don't show up that often. <laughs> they're good. Yeah, they get to, they get to be fun characters, and they have some fun interactions with their respective, like, friends and family. Yeah, no, I right. thought, like, I th Emily does a good job playing this huge nerd. Uh, and huge, huge occult true, nerd. Huge occult nerd. She's very entertaining. She's a woman uh, after your own heart. She, she knows all the the ghost stories and shit. I already know those, though. <laughs> all right, that's not true. There's a lot I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> uh, and, like she's she's a lot of fun. I think David's a lot of fun playing this, you know, school idol kind of a guy. You know, he's the cool mm -hmm. upperclassman that everybody likes. Uh, but he's all, he's also got a secret dark side because look at this school. Of course, it does. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything specific. I, they were nice. That's about it, though. But um, Teru hasn't... Sh I, the last thing I watched was, like, the last th th three or four episodes, which Teru, I don't mm -hmm. think, is in. And Aoi no. is in, like, for two minutes, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. They're good. I think, the, I think the last time Teru pops in is right before the Hellmere arc. Which is the last thing I watched, so... Yeah, I think it popped in in... I think he popped in during the early part of episode... Eight or the end of episode seven, right. one of the two, and then we don't really see him again. Yeah, so um, uh, I'll, I'll that, if you want, I can jump in a little bit. I mean, like they're, they're not fresh in my mind, but like I like their like I like I like this dub on the whole a lot, and I recall their performances being good, entertaining. Like I look forward to them coming back again, which I imagine they yeah. will. Yeah, yeah, more more than likely they will. Um, I would have to say to describe David's performance as Teru. Obviously, there's the sweet like. Like you were saying, the school idol kind of guy, the most popular guy, student council president, who's sweet, nice, and everything. The um, exorcist Teru, though, remind the tone of voice and the attitude reminds me so much of Todoroki. Yep. One hundred percent reminds me of Todoroki, because Teru means business when he gets into exorcist mode, and 
he's also very curious to see how things are gonna go because Ko is learning and growing as an exorcist too and Ko doesn't want to exercise spirits unless he has a very good reason to do so which which I'm under the assumption because we haven't seen terror exercise anything we never talk about the fact that he brought a sword to school no like <laughs> he brought a sword we just to casually brush by the reason. fact that he's just holding a golden sword yeah, I'm I mean, assuming I mean, that's the... I mean, his brother is always holding a fancy stick. No one comments I mean, on it's that. a stick. It doesn't and stab N people. Nene's going around with a skull emblem on her as well. Like, n nobody is noticing anything. Look, look, look. You can't Here's the stab thing. somebody with a look, skull look, look. pin. Psh, 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 psh. Look here. Shush for two seconds. At least with the staff and the brooch... They're there constantly. We only saw the sword once. Well, I feel I feel as we should we should point out the obvious. This obviously takes place in Tim Burton land, yes. <laughs> or possibly possibly spooky Henry Selnick land, as it were. Uh, yes. So th things like that are not questioned because uh, that would conflict too much with the aesthetic yeah. and tone. <laughs> yeah, it but um, we haven't seen in the show. We haven't seen Taro exercise anything. Um, again, he's letting Co take the lead on any of the apparitions that are at the school. But Co, uh, not Co. Taro is now, like, it's a hundred percent probably against what he's been raised to believe. Um, that's my thought on it, and because Co's ideas and things that he thinks about apparitions is, from what we can tell, is very different from Taro. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to be interesting not only seeing later on what Taro is capable of, but also how. Teru and Ko will conflict with each other mm -hmm. 100% um, with their methods and their ideals because Ko is not that strong of an exorcist currently. Um, he burned himself. <laughs> he burned himself. And Hanako's like, why you do this, boy? You're you're dumb. <laughs> but um, no, with with David, I'd like what I've heard so far of Teru. Uh, as for Emily and Aoi, she's very precious and she's very cute and I like it so, so much. Aoi, for the character that we have right now, is sweet and adorable and she's basically there kind of as exposition dumping away. <laughs> um, and that's basically okay. it. But Emily, I like Emily. She's so sweet. So, so adorable. It's, it's like the tone is similar. It's an older Aerie to me. Aoi is an older sounding airy from My Hero Academia to me. Oh, oh audio wise, okay. Yes, that's the best way I can describe it. Personality wise, Aoi is just so fun and cheerful, and she's also popular with boys fawning over she's her. She's hot and she <laughs> knows it and she loves it. Y you know she why, she, give a shit. Andrew? You know why she's hot, right? I, I feel like I. Why, Noah? Why is she hot? Uh-oh, here well, we go. Well, it's obvious because she's got the froppy haircut. Like, the, the, if you've got that, you clearly are the best girl in the entire series. That is not the froppy that's, haircut. That's, that's the fucking froppy hair. She's, she's got the, like, she's got the thing where, like, you, you, you loop your hair around in the back. Like, pull up the image. That's not froppy. What you... Put, I would put the two inches up on screen, but I can't right what now. What are you Jesus smoking, Christ. young man? I'm smoking Something blood, good, but that's not the point. The point smoking is that blood. this entire Shit. this entire group is very nice, and I'm glad that you like them, Lilac. Yes, uh, since since you're very very chatty, Noah, why don't you go next for us? Um, what was I gonna say? Uh, Aoi is uh, also is is fun because, um, and I've said this on other episodes. If you've got multiple characters that have to be in the same scene together, you got to make sure that you direct them to sound different from each other. And since mm -hmm. Aoi and um, Nene are really the only uh, student females in the entire show, uh, they spend the most time together talking, and therefore they have to sound different from each other. And luckily, Emily sounds different and performs differently from Nene's voice actress. And I really appreciate that. It's chipper, with a it's like a moderate uh, female voice tone, so it's not as high pitched as Nene mm -hmm. is. And she's also got like a bit of a, a little warble in the back of her throat that makes her sound a little more cartoonish. It's probably the most cartoonish sounding of uh, the characters that we're going to talk about. So okay. I, I appreciate her. She's she's a fun character to have around. That I'm I, again, I'm sure would uh, absolutely crush it uh, if she was like completely made the main character. 
Um, and then, then we get to Teru, which uh, it's interesting that you say that uh, we haven't seen him exercise anything yet. Because if you've mm -hmm. seen this beefcake, you can tell he already exercises a lot. He has already sacrificed many <laughs> mountains of sweat to the mountains of swole. There's that, so he has to do no, no more exercising. That that hunk of meat can absolutely bench press me to the fucking moon. And I am God all here for it. damn it. No, I love you, you bastard. <laughs> Look, Gigi is not here in this episode, so one of us has to fill the role of Thirsty for Dave Matranga. I'm sorry. <laughs> one of us had to fill that in. Now you got it. And it wasn't going to be any of you three. None of you were going to make that sacrifice, it which is fine. It wasn't going to be Steph? No, it wasn't. <laughs> because she's already got you. She, she's already got, you know, manly That doesn't mean Jack That doesn't shit mean Jack Noah. shit. When a voice is hot, a voice is fucking hot, man. When Thank a voice is attractive, a voice is attractive, and you can't fucking help it sometimes. All right, shut up, Noah. Okay. <laughs> As I drink more coffee. Let's, awesome. let's face it, Steph and I are both in agreements. There are certain voice performances that make characters sound really hot. I mean, I don't blame Nene for crushing on this guy. I, I would absolutely write um, secret diary entries to this guy as well. Thank you, Nene. <laughs> yes. That, that was so... I'm sorry. I, I, if you've ever done this, if any of you listeners have done Nene. this, that's just a little pathetic. Nene is a disaster bitch, and I love it. Look. <laughs> but, okay, it's look. fucking disaster. Look. She may be a disaster, but at least she doesn't <laughs> do shipping fan fiction of her friends. Oh, good. I appreciate that. Thank you, Nene. She's, she she does raise idols, though. Which, okay. <laughs> I, I love that when she's, like, depressed over not getting to talk to her friend for a while. So she drowns her sorrow with, with like, raising idols. I'm like, okay, that's fucking funny. <laughs> That, that's just a thing in Japan now. Like, if you saw a Gretzko season three, that's just a thing that people do. That's a thing that mm. people have been doing for a while. But, I mean, anyway, anyway, Noah, anything else? I, uh, no, I'm saving my juicier thoughts for the rest of these characters. Uh, only that if, if you crush hard on Teru from just his brief appearances, don't feel guilty. You're in good company. Huzzah. Andrew. I've seen better. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. There's a story there somewhere that we're not getting. <laughs> All right. Just, just your thoughts, sir. All right. So I will start with Emily Neves as Owie. Uh, she is adorable. She is a cutie patootie. She's hot and she knows it. She's got that one guy she's been friends with for a while that is thirsting for her hard. And she's like, oh, aren't you cute? You get five points. Out of a hundred. Out of a hundred. Like, uh, she, uh, she's not really a bitch. She's just... That man pulled weeds for her. Look, look here. Unlike Nene, who's a disaster bitch, Owie is not a disaster bitch. She's the queen bitch, thank you very much. Yes. 100%. <laughs> That's what she is. She, she just loves it. <laughs> yep. But yeah, no, uh, she's super sweet. She's super cute. I love the enthusiasm she has about talking about these ghost stories and stuff. And sh she does kind of have that cartoony inflection to her voice where it's a little exaggerated, but it, it balances very nicely to Nene, who already is kind of like mm -hmm. a disa an exaggerated disaster already. So it kind of balances mm -hmm. itself out. She's very sweet and supportive, and she's fun, and I do like her. She's got a fun design. David Petraga. Uh, David Petraga is very good at sounding like a suave, sexy, sexy, uh, good-looking fellow, and he sounds very <laughs> casual and cool and all that, but also very stern and like he's got some serious stuff going on in his past, and that he's a little more hardcore than his brother when it comes to befriending spirits, but he really likes his brother. He, like, he likes his brother, but he d doesn't want him to get too attached at fear of, like, getting himself hurt and betrayed. It's like, you know what? Mm -hmm. That's a fair reason for concern. You're be doing a good job, big bro. Um, did he ever take- did- what did he- did he eat those vegetables, by the way? No. Not as far as we know of. Well, let's hope he didn't cook them, because Jesus Christ, that shit would become mush. <laughs> He's a horrible cook. He gave him the- <laughs> he probably gave him the co. Wait. Because Ko is apparently very domesticated. Mm. <laughs> Which is fine, because someone's gonna have to be domesticated around for Teru's fucking sake. God, he's a fucking disaster, too. I mean, he, he's hot. He, he can make it work. <laughs> that, that's, that's not entirely why Nene was trying to make herself more feminine. Yeah. It's... it's. Anyways, Teru... Granted, it was for a different Teru's point, a disaster, but, but at least he's hot, so it works in his favor, I guess. 
I guess. All right, are we good to move I'm on? I'm good to move on, yeah. Yes. Okay. So our next two characters are going to be two more of the seven wonders of the school. Um, so we have Suchi Gamori, who is wonder number five, also known as the four o'clock library. Uh, basically, the story goes at four o'clock, there is a secret back room in the library where you can find books about everybody who is or has been a student at the academy. Uh, whether living or dead and you can know their entire life story past and future but you have to be very careful uh, for two reasons one there are three different types of books white black and red the white ones are books about the living the black ones are books about the dead the red ones the only thing you need to know is that you should never open those or else you're in big trouble there's a g the, the red other... ones are basically one giant spoiler warning for life <laughs> you know possibly um, and then the second problem is if you read into the book of someone who is alive and you cannot look into their future because that's another big no-no. <laughs> um, as for our other character we're going to discuss, we have Yako. She is the second of the Seven Wonders, also dubbed the Misaki Stairs. Um, her story comes up rather early on in the show where... Near the art room, there's a set of stairs, and on the fourth stair, you have to be very careful, because at a certain time of day, uh, there is blood dripping on that fourth stair, and if you happen to step on that stair, you will be basically transported away, and sh bad shit happens to you. <laughs> um, her story is actually one of the major ones in the early on that gets um, twisted around by different rumors. Um, there's a there again big plot point going on here with the rumors thing, mm -hmm. um, and it is up to Hanako, Nene, and Ko to find all of the people who went missing, including Aoi, and rescue everyone and help resolve this little issue. Uh, for the people who voice these characters, as Mr. Sujigamori, we have Ian Sinclair, who has voiced characters such as Bad Roy in the Black Butler franchise, uh, Hijikata Toshizo in Drifters, and Otohiko in Kamisama Kiss. As for Yako, we have Miss Alexis Tipton, who has voiced characters such as Pearl Fay in Ace Attorney, Loretta Crist Cristano Om Omodio in Gangster, and Kofku in Noragami. We're going to start with Andrew on this one. All right. Uh, let's see. I'll start off with Alexis, who I will admit when I first watched this, I mistook her for Jamie Markey at first, not going to lie. Hmm. Oh, I think I remember that. I think I remember. I think I was with you when we watched. I, that. I was like really it was sure Jamie. it was Jamie when I first listened to it, but then it's like and, and, watching it now. It's like okay, yeah, no, no, I, I, I do hear Alexis. Because in that first couple episodes, she's got like that lower sultry voice. She's got a very. That Jamie's she's got really like a lower, at. deeper sultry voice, which like, yeah. ja like Jamie can be very high pitched and goofy too. But it's like, I know Jamie can do sultry like, uh, tangent again. Um. So starting with Alexis, uh, she has a lot of different vocal ranges that she's working with throughout the show. She's working mm -hmm. with very deep and sultry, where it's kind of like mysterious level sultry. Like she's not really a seductress. She's more just kind of like a quiet, like mysterious figure who's a mm -hmm. little... She sounds like she's got a screw loose or two, which... Is kind of the case. She does because yes. she's she does. stealing children. She's she's drifting them away to basically build her a new hubby. And <sighs> when that doesn't work out, they turn she she turns them into dolls. And wow, that 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 husband looks great. Must have cost you an arm and a leg. Oh Jesus but, um, Christ! Oh. That hurt. No, a sit. That down. hurt almost okay. as much as those scissors. Christ Almighty. Um, but yeah, no, speaking of scissors, like, her, you find out her whole deal is that she got really attached to a teacher way back when who took a liking to her and, well, basically got attached mm. to her. Okay. I'm not even sure what's the proper way to, basically, the teacher guy could actually see spirits and started interacting with her because you find out not only is she a spirit, she is a fox spirit. You also hear, like, her her diary which is basically her being taught by misaki to read and write and you see her gradually get better 
with like language and writing and you hear it in Alexis's tone of voice when she's little babby foxy <laughs> and then you all, like she does a really good job like conveying the difference as well as like the jadedness of realizing oh this guy left me and he's never coming back and you hear her get older and jaded and like very frustrated and it's a nice contrast it's very compelling dramatic delivery from her actually i was pretty impressed and it sounds almost effortless like very good melody goes from younger to older back to baby because when she is defeated and she gets her yori shiro taken she becomes baby mm. fox she mm -hmm. comes a little bitchy baby fox when it's like oh you're cute and then she just starts <laughs> biting everybody she's like i'm not a don't call me fast. Oh, yeah, no, don't, like, don't touch my call ears. Me Alexis has a very fun time shifting her vocal range for this character in particular, and I think she does a really stellar job conveying both like the comedic aspect of it as well as like the good drama and character escalation of her. And I think mm -hmm. it's great. Okay. Speaking of which, Ian Sinclair, he starts out with his goofy Ian Sinclair voice. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes. The very whimsical, like, uh, what's a good example? Um, I'm blanking because all I'm thinking of are like Lawless. The, the tougher. Lawless. His voice in the yes. show oh, reminds yeah. me of Lawless now that I think in about the beginning, it. Yes, 100%. Specifically, he starts it. out as this kind of goofy, quirky glasses teacher where it's like, hey, watch yes. where you're going, kids. Oh, you darn little brats. And then when you see that he's actually a demon, it's like, he's got the deeper, sexier mm -hmm. register. <laughs> Jesus Christ! You know the kind of Is everything you're going to describe today sexy? God, what the fuck? Let's put it like this. If Gigi was to hear this kind of voice, she would say, Oh, gee, oh, gee, oh, gee. Uh, isn't this, she, isn't, would, isn't, she would want Suchi Gamori to it, step on her with his... Like, he's got a lot of likes to step on her with. Sense. It works out pretty yeah. nicely, all things considered. <laughs> and, and, Andrew, isn't that more or less the voice that Ian used when we saw him at the con in Texas and he recognized Gigi from a previous convention? Maybe. Do you not remember that moment? Because I do. That was, no, that was very I good. Remember this. As someone who oh, attended shit. both the Yomacon trip and the Texas trip, it was yeah. quite the experience. Yeah, no, I can hear. Oh, Anyways, yeah. point. Uh, yeah, what was, was I fucking fun. saying? Yeah, he's got a little bit of a lower register when he actually reveals himself, but he's still got a bit of that mm -hmm. misfit, playful tone of voice where he's like, tell me your juiciest secrets. Or, yep. oh, yes. or sometimes when there's like a good comedic egg, Quip, he'll sometimes go into that more goofy register again. Like, one of my favorites mm -hmm. when he's, like, showing Nene her, uh, Suchi... Uh, Yorishiro. I, Yorishiro, When yes. he's showing her Yorishiro and he's got all these jewels in his cave, it's like, ooh, which one of these is it? It's like, uh, it's actually this. She's just like, it's filthy! And he just says, you're filthy! <laughs> Suchi Gamori has a few fun little quips. He's got some fun little quips, but... The part where I really, where I really sold on Ian is uh, his flashback with good mm. old Yugi Amine, yes. where there's some really good, compelling, dramatic work from Ian, which I think that's why my biggest point of comparison to like Ian's hundreds of roles at this point is Lawless, because a, my friend Beth has been talking about watching Servant this week, and she was like, oh shit, Lawless just steals the entire fucking show in one episode, where basically it's a lot of that kind of goofy, exaggerated tone of voice, but also, like, really impressive dramatic works in, like, a particular moment mm -hmm. when he's going into a, a human who changed his fate, and he talks about how he, he could have been, he was going to be a science teacher, they would have been colleagues, but he just decided not to do anything, and it was... Like, actually really tragic. Like, wow. Mm -hmm. That's sad, and I felt for you. And it's also kind of cool getting to see a time period of, like, Japan during the moon landing. I'm like, that's an interesting time yeah. period that we don't really go into that much. Alexis Tipton is very good, and Ian Sinclair continues to be very good as well. They're both veterans at this point for a goddamn good reason, and this continues to show why. I'm going to piggyback off of that and go directly into Ian because 100% the highlight of his performance as Suchi Gomori is that episode. What number six. was that? Number six. six. It was episode six because you are correct. This, this comment is valid to Ian, Alexis, as well as um, 
Hanako as and um, Sukasa, who we'll talk about later, they have to play with their range consistently. Um, because these apparitions, <laughs> they're all over the place. Especially when we get to Tsukata, Tsukasa and then um, Hanako especially. They're kind of all over the place. But in the case of Ian, you are right. He does have this goofy, like, normal tone that you usually associate Ian for. And then when it flips, you know exactly who Suchikamori is. He goes into a deeper register. Just like, ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the fifth wonder. This is what I do. Hello. <laughs> but, um... 100% episode 6 is a very strong, strong episode because Ian ha Ian's tone of voice has is more solemn to me. Um, especially particularly talking about Yugi Amane. Um, and we know all this, the whole story about his interactions with him and what his original fate was supposed to be. And credit where credit is due, the monologue at the end of that episode, where he's talking to Nene mm -hmm. in the uh, nurse, nurse's office, and she is explaining, I actually knew about his future. And he, and what you were saying before, he was supposed to become a science teacher, we would have been colleagues. It was such a solemn, it, it, was, it was such a solemn and like somber moment that I think Ian conveyed so, so well that I think that point was the highlight for me. The flashback itself was really strong. I did like that. But I think it was the monologue after that with Nene in the infirmary that was the strongest point for me in Ian's performance. Um, we need to make sure Gigi knows about Hanako-san and that Ian is in here because she will instantly love the fuck out of this. Um, Don't anyway, have to give her the whole show. Just give her the one episode. Just give her episode six. Done. Um... Alexis Tipton as Yako. Um, I liked most of the description that you used, Andrew, but I'm going to add another description to the performance for Alexis. Uh, she's very haunting. Mm. She's, she's very hauntingly beautiful, which is, I think, the tone that this character in particular needs because when the rumor is twisted, she does become a little bit menacing, but it's not overplayed it's not cheesy it's not anything she still has this haunting tone to her and i think that i think alexis straight up hit that out of the park 100 percent during that um and she even keeps that tone because we do see the human form of yako again a little later on when we get to hell of mirrors arc um where she helps hanako and ko find a way to get into the boundary for the hell of mirrors um and it's just a fun, darker, haunting tone that I really, really loved with Alexis. And then, of course, when she turns into Fox Spirit, she's very cutesy and adorable. And that, the cutesy Fox form, that's the tone that we normally associate Alexis with in most, most series and most characters she's played. Kind of reminds me of Kofuku in a way, of Ninorigami. But I'm more impressed with this haunting haunting, more somber, more darker tone um, when she's human um, Yako instead. So I want to, I think I need to give kudos to Alexis on that one. But yeah, both of these both of these characters, as apparitions, they have to fluctuate and play with their range a lot to display different part, sides and parts of the apparitions, and both of them do very, very well with this. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with what's been said about Alexis. Uh, she's, she's a lot of fun in this role. She does a good job of nailing the kind of mysterious, haunting aspects of Yakko when she's in her sort of person form and scrounging around her boundary and she's the one she's the one that makes them put dolls together, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yes. that's that, that one that one does a good really job of kind of balancing the line between being funny and unsettling because it's so mm -hmm. weird. Yes. It's one hundred percent. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not, I would not actually call it Lynchian, but it has that quality of like, what am I looking at? Who just had a giant padded bra lying around? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> I need, I, I don't have the curves, Nene. Padded bra. I had these all along. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <sighs> that girl's a disaster. Bless her heart. She's <laughs> trying. Bless her heart. She's doing her she's best. She's not trying well, but she's uh, trying. She's... An attempt was made. Exactly. <laughs> was 
made. That's her you character tried. in a nutshell. An attempt, attempt was made. Was made. Uh, <laughs> wrong. But um, yeah, Alexis is very good playing not adult, but like person Yako, and she's very cute when Yako turns into a fox and is just um, cute but snarly because mm -hmm. she, she'd rather not be a fox. She's basically <laughs> just a yokai chihuahua. <laughs> oh my god! I hate you because I can't say you're wrong. <laughs> and I don't, I don't like that fact. It irritates me. <laughs> oh, babe, why? Why you do this? They why hated must you, him. Why must you get? They why hated him because he truths? told them the truth. Oh, they were, they were, all, they were all, shocked by his doctrine. All the best Japanese shrines have chihuahuas right at the bottom of the stairs. So yeah, Alexis, this, good, good job. Uh, Ian, Ian's pretty consistently one of my favorite actors in the Texas acting pool. I like him a lot. Yeah. Uh, I think you can see that here. He has a lot of range on him. He can play funny, silly stuff really well. He can play a uh, drama really well. Uh, he just does he's a very good job of even taking a character like this, who, uh, you know, sometimes he's a goofy teacher, sometimes he's more, you know, serious and alluring, but mysterious and also, you know, has regrets in life. Uh, he's just able to balance all that out really well and make it sound like, ah, this is the same person. Uh, this feels consistent. He's one of those actors who's very good at making me not think about the mechanics of acting when he's when he's mm. doing it. He just plays the character really well in a way that's good but not flashy unless the you know, if he's playing Brooke, he plays <laughs> the skeleton man. <laughs> Uh, which, I like how that's which, the example we're going into, because of course it is. Look, when, when there was a meme going around that said, post your four favorite One Piece characters, did I post Brooke four times? Of course I did. Absolutely. <laughs> well, okay, okay. Why wouldn't you? The, the more I think about it, yeah, no, Brooke is literally everything you strive to be as a person. Look, I hit that part <laughs> of the manga, and I just took a photo of his introduction, which just lists him as Brooke. Gentleman skeleton. It's like it's everything I've ever wanted. And he's a musician <laughs> too. It's great. Um, anyways, but like, Brooke requires a certain ostentatiousness that maybe this role doesn't require. But he can still play the silliness very well. He can keep it down to earth when he needs to. He's got a lot of like. I, I appreciate how much versatility Ian is able to get as a voice actor, and he is always a treat to hear in pretty much everything I've heard of him, and this included. It's good stuff. All right, Noah, anything to add? Uh, actually, not a whole lot, because you guys hit all the major talking points, especially about the versatility of the characters jumping from one form and then shifting to something else, where, you know, mm -hmm. Ian goes from the goofy glasses-wearing uh, uh, librarian and then cuts into the Wan Chi Tong-style talking voice that's like, yes, please step on me. And then same thing with Alexis, where she's you know go she jumps from sultry to uh, babby. I'm glad you used that word. I'm glad mispronounced words have become part of the English lexicon now. It, we don't need to invent new words. We just have to mispronounce existing words. So uh, the only thing I want to note is that uh, okay. th I do kind of hate that the way that the story is structured, and I'm assuming the manga is very similar. These characters don't get to be in the show as much as I feel like they should be, and this is kind of just the unfortunateness of having these many characters show up in a show that's this short is that i'm i'm going to say this much because i started reading the manga and i actually bought volume two today mm -hmm. um and andrew can and can attest to this we were i was trying to figure out originally where does the anime story stop and the manga like picks up from there mm -hmm. it actually doesn't the story is kind of out of order actually right most of it does follow true to the manga um however um, the Helmier actually comes later in Volume 7, and we basically skip over a couple volumes of material to get to there. Hmm. So they wanted to get the, the more popular content in this season. We, I can't speak for that. We don't know that for sure. I mean, they could always backtrack well, to some of this other stuff later if they want to, which well, and they probably they, should. But I mean, uh, with the expectation that this would be the only season, because there was no guarantee that something this Amon was going to be successful enough to warrant a <laughs> second season. If it makes season. you feel any better, how, how, the manga sold really well after the anime came out in Japan. Which we know mm -hmm. now, right? That's right. No, no. How good. dare how dare you correctly call my love of things that fail miserably in the commercial market? The the. <laughs> It hurts, man. Look, Am I, I Amon has uh, earned the chainsaw, man. He has earned yeah. that hard. 
Amon, Amon has deserved to become a verb at this point. The manga does skip a huge chunk of the story, 100%, um, in order to get to the last third of it. But, but even taking that into account, these characters are not designed to be recurring characters. They're designed to show up when the plot needs them. Like, y Yakko, not Animaniacs, but actual Yakko in this, doesn't show up again after her initial introduction until we need her in the... Uh, uh, four o'clock library episode mm -hmm. and you know she she serves no function while they're just doing regular classroom stuff they only need her again when they're, the plot dictates we need the spirits for whatever reason they're basically just neutral observers for most of the show right. until like until hanako like needs a favor right. and which, right. which which i mean or well he doesn't necessarily need a favor he just wants to boss them around because he's in charge so <laughs> that you're not wrong so, uh, but right. yes, as far as <laughs> the voice acting on this goes, and I did not watch the Japanese, so I can't compare, but mm -hmm. based on these two alone, and again, we're just still in the only the second group here, really top tier stuff that would absolutely warrant watching this in the English dub. Okay, so our next three characters, they're essentially the group as our main, they're grouped as our main uh, antagonistic trio. Mm -hmm. Um... There is technically a fourth that joins them later, but we're going to discuss them in a little while. Uh, so we have Natsuhiko Hyuga, uh, we have Sakura Nanamine, and as our main antagonist, really, I like to put him as our main antagonist here, Tsukasa yep. Yugi. I'm standing with the man in the mirror. Jesus I'm Christ, basketball. we're not there yet. Okay. We're not there yet. Um, so Sakura Nanamine is the girl who is helping warp the rumors about these different apparitions and the sphere and the um seven wonders in order to cause utter fucking chaos uh natsuhiko is <laughs> basically there because he loves sakura and wants to do whatever he can to win it win her affection and all this dumb stuff he's an idiot <laughs> i i did not anticipate how much of a fucking dumbass this guy was. We're, we'll get to him um Sakura is similar to Nene and Hanako's relationship. She is the assistant assistant to Tsukasa Yugi. Now, Tsukasa Yugi is an apparition who grants the wishes of those of the dead. Uh, similar to how Hanako will grant wishes for the living. Uh, but it comes at a price. And there's a character, we're, we keep alluding to him, we're going to get to a little bit. Um... We also learn that Tsukasa is actually the younger twin brother of Hanako. And Hanako murdered Tsukasa when the two of them were alive many years ago. Supposedly. We don't... So they, Allegedly. I'm just, going based on, I'm just going based on what we learn in the show. Alright? In the show, we hear... We, we know that... We supposedly know that Hanako murdered his younger twin brother. For what reason, we do not know. Read the manga, something like that. Or, hopefully or season, two, season two, please and thank you. Season two, Japan, please and thank you. Um, voicing these three characters. As Natsuhiko, we have Aaron Dismuk, who has voiced characters such as Rail in Aka 13 Territory Inspection Department, Senku Ishigami in Dr. Stone, and 12 in Terror in Residence. As Sakura Nanamine, we have Kara Edwards, who has voiced characters such as, if I mispronounce this name, I know someone's going to correct me, Fei in Nichijo. What? I think it's Saye. F -E. No, F-E. Oh, oh, Fee. That's the name of the character. Fee. Thank you. Uh, Eternal Feather and Soul Eater Knot. And Patty Baldwin in The Sacred Blacksmith. And as for Tsukasa Yugi, we have Austin Tyndall. Who has voiced characters such as... Wow, that is a huge misspell of uh, that name. Karma Akabane. How, how'd you spell <laughs> Assassination it? Classroom. Karama. <laughs> There's an extra A in there when there shouldn't be. <laughs> uh, accelerator in the... Here we go. Long, long one. Here we go. A certain magical index, certain scientific railgun, and certain scientific accelerator franchise. <laughs> and Nito Monoma mm. in My Hero Academia. Uh, let's throw this to Noah since you went last. How would you go first on your thoughts? So is it just a requisite that Austin Tyndall has to play the main bad guy in every Lurch anime now? No. I was thinking of Assassination Classroom. I know he's not the he's bad not guy. He's not even the, the same, villain. Like, wait a second. He's a friend. Hold, 
And hold on, if we want to add more Lurch anime, and Andrew, you can correct me, he's not the main villain of Danganronpa, thank you very much. No, but this show looks like Danganronpa. Like, before, again, before I even looked up the credits or anything, the very first frame of the show, I'm just like, oh, 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 God, who who let the Danganronpa crew out of their cage? He's, I'm like, yeah. He's fucking Ishimaru. He's one of the goodest good boys in Danganronpa. He's literally a he's goody He's such two-shoes. a good fall monitor, dude. I haven't... He did nothing wrong. Nope. Like, he's that's not, not even one of the point. more antagonistic characters. Anyways, I'm going... No! That, that's not my point. My point is anyways, that... Anyways. My point is Austin is, a, an, is an amazing bastard. Just a wonderful bastard. And I'm, I was so glad... I'm glad they didn't do the thing where um, they had uh, Hanako's voice actor also play his twin in mm, the show. Yeah. I mean, they, yep. they could have done that. And I don't know if they did that in the Japanese either. I'm going to look that but... up because I'm curious now. Hang on. Yeah. I bet I can find it faster than you because I have ANN pulled okay. up. Give I... me a minute. While I'm, yeah. So if you're gonna watch the show and you're thinking like uh, there's not uh, there's not enough conflict or there's not enough antagonism ah. in here, uh, look no further than this character because he absolutely wipes the floor with everyone's expectations and just plays everyone's hearts like a little four string violin. And I love. May I answer that? May I answer the question for you? What's up? Megami Ogata bo- voiced both Hanako and. Tsukasa. Okay, so if you want to go for an not- actual Dongan Ropa comparison, that's fucking. <laughs> Ma- Makoto Nayagi and Nagito Kobayna and... right there. Kobayna, I forgot! <laughs> Shit! I forgot she did both. Yes, she did. Yeah. Anyway, Noah, continue. One of these days I will actually play Danganronpa and get the references you made. Just watch the made, anime, dude. Or I will wa- I haven't done that either. Look, if Noah doesn't want to waste several <laughs> hours on a video game, just let him watch the anime. He'll get the gist of it. It, it. Is it comparable to, like, is it actually worth watching? Like, I've heard some video, like, Persona 4, I think. So, was so, 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 Rampa, the, the animation, anime. which is actually based off of the first video game. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Um, it's... Daikonrapa 3, Despair, and Future Arcs, they do not follow any sort of video game, but they are canon in the actual You need Daikonrapa 2 at least, and that is not an anime. Yeah, that's oh, the downside. Gotcha, okay. That's no, nothing no, to do with the show. No, I'm gonna say split the difference, watch the Let's Play that uh, Dallas and Jill do, even though it's not finished, because oh, yeah. that's very entertaining. Even though it's not finished. You're right. Anyway, rail it, r- bring it back in, boys. Bring it back in. I'm no. on these rails. I'm on these rails. And speaking of getting Stay railed, rails. speaking Stay of getting railed, rails. Aaron's character is not really important. <laughs> I didn't feel like he's watching. He's not this. that lucky. He's not lucky in that department. No, he's not. God, he and, but that's he could get railed. That, yes, he does. <laughs> oh, that poor guy. But um. I, I kind of questioned like uh, why uh, Natsuhiko was uh, really in the show to begin with, and I do like his uh, his ability to send. Uh, he's the paper crane guy, right? Yeah. Yes. Wait, no, isn't technically. That no, technically that's Sukasa being a devious little shit. Okay. okay. Um, Natsuhiko just snuck the paper crane in there. That's really all he did. Okay, so yeah, he hasn't really done very much in this show. He he kind of acts as the um the butt monkey for Sakura just to kind of play off of. Um, but, uh, considering that, uh, I know Aaron mostly for playing, like, uh, more mischievous characters, uh, I kind of appreciate that he gets to play a more subdued character in this, uh, series. Um, and I don't know if he'll get to play more of a role in the future, but, uh, mm-hmm. he, he adds a nice, well, he, he makes the cast more well-rounded, I guess I would say. But okay. the, the MVP of this trio, uh, I feel like really is, uh, Caro Edwards, because her, uh voice has to kind of carry the spooky factor for this entire show and not just over the radio like she does do uh the radio demon thing at the beginning of every episode and kind of gives us what the premise is going to be about but she also uh is kind of like toying with the characters like she shows up in episode and says you should check out the four o'clock library very mysteriously the end of five Mm -hmm. i think that's the case. What's that? The, oh, yeah. Oh, right. At the end of the Confession Tree episode. Yeah. Or yeah. should I say the Lemon Tree episode? hey oh, Jesus Christ. Oh. By the way, can I just say this? <laughs> Hearing fucking Wishbone as a fucking Confession <laughs> oh, no, Tree was, threw yeah, me for a loop. That was Larry, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. I salute you, Larry Brantley. <laughs> I'm so glad that we get to hear him semi-regularly again. I'm so oh, glad he got I back. I love it the- so much. Oh. It is so good. Noah, tune in to watch Africa Salary, man. You're in for a wild ride. <laughs> You're oh, right. Shit. You're right. I do want to watch that. Oh my god. Uh, where was I? Uh, Sakura. Uh, yeah. Um. And uh, to 
to uh, also give credence to uh, the variety of voices that we've got here, um, uh, I actually thought that the radio voice that we'd heard in the first couple of episodes was Yoko's character because they had kind of a similar oh. uh, sultry voice to them. Um, I will admit I also made that mistake, so I can believe it. Yeah. Um, but once uh, once we kind of um, established a little bit more about what Sakura's personality was, what her deal was, um, it kind of helped sell that voice a lot more. And it, it did make it, honestly, a little bit creepier, especially when we find out that she is kind of planting rumors in the ears of individuals. And it gets mm -hmm. super, super creepy in uh, the episode eight, oh, the uh, Mitsuba God, episode, yeah. yes. which we'll get we'll get into his character. But essentially, uh, here's how we're going to make people remember you. Uh, we're going to tell people that if they don't remember your name, uh, they're going to die. They're, they're, yep. they're going to six they're going to deep six and that makes her character deep just six. really really creepy but I enjoy it I, I it ramps up the creepiness element that we don't get from the main characters because even though the main character is a ghost he's not scary he, you know he, he's he, Hanako the friendly ghost he's okay Hanako's a gremlin is what oh he God I'm gonna, is. I'm gonna make a terrible I, I would I would still I would still play mini golf with that guy. I would too. <laughs> so that, that's what I got on these three. Uh, I feel like they're they're being set up to be even more important in future events of the story. Andrew, you look like you want to say something, so why don't we go into okay, your Okay, before I go into an actual serious discussion about this character, if I had to compare uh, Tsukasa compared to uh, Amine, a.k.a. Hanako, mm -hmm. um, Hanako is Casper the Friendly Ghost. Tsukasa is his uncle's. Mm, the uncle's doing. That's a stretch. A stretch. How about that? No, no, no. I got. No, 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 no. No, this. Hanako is Danny Phantom. Tsukasa is Dark Danny. Okay. You didn't even go All for right. any of the cooler antagonists from Danny Phantom. Andrew, He's not they're Skulk twin brothers. He's not Skulker. I love him. Andrew, Skulker. the two Skulker's of them are twin cool. brothers. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, okay. Now I'm getting back on the rails. Get I'm getting back on the rails. Please. I'm getting get back, get on, back the on the rails. Let's talk about the guy who wants to get railed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's talk about Aaron Dismuke because mm -hmm. when this dude was introduced, like it was pretty clear he was going to be antagonist of some sort. I just assumed he was going to be a little more threatening or antagonistic nope the most <laughs> evil thing he does is put her in a fishbowl which yep. you know as you do i've heard of getting catfish but this is ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> not wrong ah okay that's 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 my actual clever joke for the night i got one <laughs> Anyway, continue. Um, I expected him to be a lot more antagonistic, maybe even a little, like, threatening or straight up, like, full-on, like, yandere in regards to Sakura. He's just... Oh, how do I describe it? He's just a dude who, like, fell for her and just kind of never left. Like, he, he saw that she was doing evil plans, and instead of, like, getting, like, killed for his insubordination, he was just like, jokes on you, that only gets me going even more. And then she's just like, ah, fuck it, I don't have time for this. Welcome aboard. Yay! <laughs> like, you know, you know what sucks? You're probably right. And if that is the actual backstory for this bitch, <laughs> I'm gonna be upset. Like, there, he, there's actual character backstory like the, the thing that blew my mind is that they're leaving uh nene to die and he's just in a chair too it's like wait why are you here it's like oh yeah no she wanted to leave me to die too like oh okay this is a trial of our it's love a trial of our love like, <laughs> i thought he was a playboy the reality is he's a simp He oh is God, actually right. a sim. You're fucking right, and that's terrible. It's just, oh my God. I, I don't even know how to describe it. Like this is a, this is such it's Playboy Aaron with the level of charisma. Okay. Okay, I'm about to say something. This is Aaron Tismuke if he was playing like a Johnny Bravo. <laughs> Oh my god. Like, he he is a villain, but he has that same level of 
dumbass flirty himbo energy <laughs> that Johnny Bravo Jesus. has. He is not a himbo. Oh, no, hold up. Rewind those rails. You gotta respect <laughs> women to be a himbo, and we are missing a crucial element okay, here. Okay, okay. That is true. Okay. Do That's you, true. That, do you? Not that Hiko maybe doesn't. I would argue <laughs> that Johnny Bravo does. There is an argument to be made that Johnny Bravo does. <laughs> that is for an entirely different video essay, which we will put together in 2025. Motherfucker, you think I won't go to bat for Johnny Bravo's honor? It's fine. My mom <laughs> will go to bat for Johnny Bravo's honor. She <laughs> likes that he respects his mom. Oh my god. That's, that's perfectly fine. That, that's respectable. The but there are more about? women in the world than just his Boys. mom. Boys. Boys. Uh, Gentlemen, okay, um, speaking of mom, rail it back in here. Come on. Eric Dismuke is hilarious. He's goofy. He straight up gets Terminator 2'd and almost died. And he just <laughs> survives because, like, I, I I don't know what the purpose of this character is. I just did not expect his purpose to be, oh, Nen is here and he's going to be a kind of comedic dumbass. I like that twist. <laughs> ne let's talk about... um. Kara Edwards. I really like Kara Edwards. She's a very versatile actor. I have not... I have not heard her do what is basically this kind of monotone, like, stoic, creepy, mm -hmm. porcelain doll antagonist character. Like, I've, I've heard her play much more, like, hyperactive, cutesy characters, and this is a lot more, like, stoic and subdued. It's mm -hmm. really interesting, actually, and, like, they describe her kind of like a porcelain doll. It's like, that's very much what her deal is. She's really pretty, but she's also kind of, like eerie uncanny valley where she is really pretty but she is she is really like she would be like a horror movie character she would be like the she would be the girl that is secretly <laughs> possessed or is like uh just like hiding an urge to kill in a horror movie come play with mm -hmm. us nene forever come play with and us, ever <laughs> yeah, yeah no no 100%. yeah i can see her in a stephen king book yeah, I see it. I could see her in a Stephen King novel, 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, no, Kara Edwards just got this very cold, subdued voice. That's really interesting. I love the way when it comes through, like, the radio. It's just really genuinely chilling. And I want, I would absolutely get scared shitless if she read me uh, <laughs> stories from the Midnight Society or something like that. Oh, hell uh, yeah. But yeah, no, Kara Edwards, like, she's really good. Um... I have a question for you, Stephanie. Oh God, what? What category is this? What do you mean, what category? What's the villain's Ca category? No. What category Tyndall are we working with here? <laughs> oh. <Fuck. laughs> oh man. I oh, think we're man. at least working on a four. It's possible we're at a four. You're the, right. The I, I need to consult Megan on the categories consult of Megan Austin. Consult Megan on the um, Hurricane Austin schedule, sc scale later. <laughs> but even for Austin <sighs> Tyndall, this is a much higher voice than I'm usually used to. And having the context that both uh, Sukasa and Amine were played by Megami Ogata, like, th th it's probably, like, this is Tyndall trying to match a <laughs> tone of voice. And actually pretty successfully, too. Like, I did not know that... Like, Tyndall can go high-pitched, but this is pretty high-pitched Tyndall, even for Tyndall. Like, it's pretty out there, actually. It's pretty up there for him. It's kind would of... You, would you say that's... Wait, I'm sorry, would you say it's startling also, not just because it's higher-pitched, but because he's obviously doing, like, the nice guy voice, but in a mocking way? He's playing, like... This is the kind of voice where this would be a friendly character, but, like, mm -hmm. the thing that's so unnerving is that he is genuinely, like, super friendly. He's like, hi, big brother! It's so good to see you again! But, like, oh my god, he's fucking scary. He's mm -hmm. so unnerving. He's, like, a twisted child murderer. And, like, the fact that he so casually talks about his, like, fucking homunculi pet project like it's nothing. And just straight up beats to death like another one of the seven wonders and just does a straight up like hum like ghost human experimentation on it just because he can and just because he basically is the monkey's paw wish giver it's so creepy but he's also weirdly cute and the fact that like sakura refers to him is like ah oh, he's 
he's like a cat at this point. He just comes and goes and mm. clings to me mm. and does what he wants. So I don't really think of him as like my master. I just think of him as a cat. This is a really unnerving kind of crazy Tyndall. Like even when I'm pretty used to Austin Tyndall's range, this is nuts mm -hmm. even for him. I'm genuinely impressed. Okay. I, I very much so. Also, I got a good laugh at the scene where Nene assumes that Sakura is uh, Hanako's boyfriend. And then <laughs> both of her dumbasses in crime just cling to her and are freaking the fuck out. And like, wait, I yep. didn't know you were dating him. And then like the sip that is uh, Aaron's guy is like, no, how can you be seeing somebody else? And they're clinging to her and shaking to her. And she's just like, this is my life now. <laughs> this is this is my hole. It was made like just they, for me. They are antagonists <laughs> in that they are fucking up the natural order and turning uh, apparitions into much more evil, like antagonistic figures. So they are the bad guys, mm -hmm. but they're also kind of just dicks that are <laughs> hanging around and having tea parties. <laughs> they they they're 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 kind of they're like halfway to that. Uh, I forget the the time Bokan trio that like team oh, rocket yeah. or that that character type they're like that the team except rocket one type. of them may legitimately not understand how evil he is yeah and the other two don't care box. like they're <laughs> kind of like they are basically uh how would I say at, they are connect chaotic neutral slash lawful evil and what is just chaotic <laughs> stupid. <laughs> That's how I describe it. I bet you can't guess which one's the chaotic, stupid boys and girls. God, that just just put that put that screenshot of Garfield with a picture of Garfield and the X crossed over it with the subcaption. I wonder who they're talking about. Something like that. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I like all three of these performances, but I was especially impressed by both Kara Edwards and Austin Tindall, particularly. Alman, do you have anything to add? Uh, I liked Kara's performance a lot. She just does a good job of playing this very, like, icy, cool character. I liked a lot of her, her like, radio stuff. Especially because mm -hmm. I like radios. It's it's a fun medium. Uh, but it's, like, it's just, it's, they're played very well. I like the little bits where she's, like, talking about, you know, the, the ghost stories, the, the school, and that kind of thing. Um, I always remain cons consistently amused by the fact that sweet little Aaron Dismuke, <laughs> that cute, that cute little kid who voices Alphonse yep, has, 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 has grown up into a guy who is he... so, excels so much at playing like cocksure assholes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, let, let's not forget. And then Senku. Let, I was gonna, let's not forget one other child actor, he, uh, child character he played back in those days, uh, Hiro from Fruits Basket. Ah, yes. I never watch a lot of Fruits Basket, so whenever I think of young Aaron, it's just Al. It's just, okay. That's it's the just big Al one, obviously. It's just Al um, and then and then there's puberty, Aaron. When we go into like Trinity Blood. <laughs> oh man, the never watched that. Uh, but yeah, like Aaron, Aaron, I find Aaron very very funny in this, just because he's so astonishingly deadpan <laughs> about every just his life's in danger. But like, whatever, I'll just prove my love that way. <laughs> he's he. I would I would if they want to start uh, if they decide to replace the little after credits short with just him uh <laughs> almost dying and failing to understand that 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 was the goal i would be pr mm -hmm. perfectly happy also i love the <laughs> face when he opens the first door and then he just closes it and it's like oh that was great <laughs> that, 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 that that's a straight that up great. uh what was it muppet show style reaction <laughs> absolutely yeah, absolutely and it's glorious um and <clears throat> Uh, Austin is, he's just really good. Uh, I think, I, I think you kind of gotta, like, the thing that's kind of scary about Tsu Tsukasa is he is very friendly, and I mm -hmm. don't think he views anything he's doing as wrong. That's what yes. makes, him so makes him so scary. Really, it's, yep. it's, it's, it makes him so upsetting because he doesn't see the problem with any of this. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know why you're wigged out. Uh, and that makes him way more intimidating than someone like Sakura, who maybe isn't quite as grotesque but her her actions seem more purposeful and that is less horrifying than Tsukasa who might just do stuff right and sucks to be you he is he is a child <laughs> who never really grew up with the moral compass no you know what you know what no that's what he is he's he's fucking what's his name he's knives um, from Trigun 
No, no, no. He's, um... What's the actors? He's Bill Mummy in that Twilight Zone episode with the cornfield. Oh my uh, god! Gotcha. Uh, there we go. Oh. Like, that's there's... what he is. He's just... No one taught him no. Yeah. Oh god, fuck. And unfortunately, because there is possible alluding to uh, Tsukasa abusing his own brother, I don't know, like... <laughs> we don't have confirmation, but the illusion is there. Like, I'm, look, Hanako, as much of a troll as he is, seems like a reasonable dude. I'm assuming he doesn't... <laughs> he doesn't seem like the kind of kid who goes around murdering people for no, for nothing. No. It's like, something Especially your happened. own family. Yeah. Something, yeah, something happened with those two. Um, but yeah, all three of these put in, like, real good performances. I find them very entertaining. Um, let's see what else I can add to this. Uh, Aaron Dismuke is Natsuhiko. He's a fucking dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> He's a dumbass, and I love it. It's like, it's like if you took the tone of Senku a little bit, and you just made him, instead of a fucking super genius, you dumbed him down, like, a billion percent. <laughs> and this, this is this is very much like, what if Senku was a dim-witted playboy rather than yes, a super genius? Yes, 100% this is if Senku was a dim-witted playboy. And Aaron is just so so much fun. I, I love when Aaron gets to have f these fun roles. Like, I mean, Senku is a different kind of fun, but then you have these fun, more refreshing moments where you get to play someone who's just so fucking stupid. And he just ha oozes the... Well, he thinks, anyway. He oozes this charisma and this charm when in reality he's... he's you can't even describe <laughs> this character. Um, and I won't lie, I want to see more Natsuhiko and his stupid ass. Because <laughs> it's just so much fun. Um, Kara Edwards as Sakura. Um, I will also agree, I have never heard Kara Edwards do a tone of voice like Sakura's before. Fantastic as like a radio voice, 100%. She does give that haunting and spooky tone to portray and tell these stories and these rumors, which is fantastic. Um, she also does keep the tone normally as well, though, and, like, Andrew brought it up. The best description. She is a porcelain doll. And the tone of voice is kind of what you would expect, a, like, a doll-like voice to me. So I think it works very well for the character. 100% for me, the star of this section is Austin. 100%. Kara is a solid second, but Austin is the star of this section because what the big thing that Austin has to do is be the twin of Hanako, which means matching matching Hanako and his actor's portrayal of him, whether it's in tone, in personality, in some of his antics, and it works really well. And it's very interesting going from Megumi Og Og Ogata who did voice both Hanako and Tsukasa in the Japanese, and you have Austin and then Hanako's actor, who, we'll, of course, we'll discuss later. But that is the biggest challenge that Austin has to face, especially with Hanako already being established more than half of the, half of the series earlier. So now Austin has to come in and basically... He basically has to do his best impression of Hanako, in a sense, but twist it just enough to make it his own and make Tsukasa stand on his own as a character, which I think Austin does fantastically and masterfully. Um, and yeah, like you guys were saying, it's not often you hear Austin pitch his voice up a little bit um, in a tone like this, but of course, again, it's in order to kind of match the tone of voice being used for Hanako. So that's the biggest challenge that Austin has with this character is matching what Hanako does but giving it enough of a spin to make it his own character, and I think he does that fantastically. So, for sure, Austin's one of my, is my favorite performance of this show. And God damn it, is this dude, oh, creepy as fuck. <laughs> like, I know we mentioned it earlier. Him going up to freaking Hanako is like, Big Brother, I missed you. And then he, like, Hanako's just standing there, mortified, and then the little twinges where Austin has to come and he's like, I thought we can play together like we did in the old days, right? I, 
I think one of his best deliveries is, uh, it's like episode eight, I think, where he, he goes up to Hanako and says, oh, how long has it been since we've seen each other? Yes. Has it been 20 years, that. 50 years? Oh, wait, no, we just saw each other the other day. That God. moment. Oh, that, that whole bit was just, ooh, it was, God, uh, you want to, it was You chilling. want to talk good great. delivery when he grants the wish. Mm. Oh, that entire speech was so fucking creepy. You, you could hear the monkey's paw curling. Mm -hmm. You hear the mm -hmm. you hear him literally breaking the finger to curl it. Yeah, like it's oh my god, like if anything, like honestly, Austin would probably be one of my favorite performances in the show because of so many challenges that he has to that he has in front of him with this character, and he just exceeds my expectations with it. 100%. It does it, it does take a minute to get used to when you first hear him because it's not an Austin we're familiar with. Not even. But like going through it a second time and you understand like okay, he's the younger twin of Hanako. And you understand what the contacts and you understand what they are going for. It works. Mm -hmm. I it works. Um again, not an Austin you're usually used to, but I I masterfully done honestly to me. Um, I think we're ready to move on. Yes. yes. Okay. We've been alluding to uh, <laughs> this character for a hot minute. Um, so let's talk about Ko Minamoto and Sosuke Mitsuba. Um, <laughs> Ko Minamoto, we've discussed him a little bit earlier with his when talking about his older brother Teru. Uh, Ko is a third year junior high student at the same academy that Nene attends. And he is from the Minamoto fam clan of exorcists as well. He's a young exorcist. He's still learning. He's not that good at it. <laughs> um, but Teru has left him in charge to basically keep an eye out and watch all of the apparitions and the spirits and everything going on at the school um, in order for him to learn to be a better exorcist. And uh, he gets... <laughs> I, I like he gets caught up in all the shenanigans. I, I like this this trope because this is something that again you see a lot of in anime. It's it's the character who was set up to be the main antagonist of the series, and then basically two episodes into their introduction, they become just another member of the friends group. I, He's the th Ko is the third lead character of this I, show. If you really want to describe I, it better. Okay, hang on. He's not really set up as an antagonist. He's no, no he's, a, he's a he introduces he's a himself. He introduces himself as a as an exorcist. He's a foil at best. I don't think I ever he's saw this. He's a foil this. at best, but not really a true antagonist. He, he is yeah. introduced well, right, into I, the show, climbing on the stairs and laughing maniacally while everybody stares at him like an idiot. He was never set up to be a threat. Anyway, um, that is Ko in a nutshell. Mitsuba, oh precious. Precious Mitsuba, who did nothing wrong. He doesn't want to be in your porn. He spends, he spends most of one episode incessantly body shaming Nene for no reason. He, He's a jerk. He, okay. To his credit, he does not remember jack shit about who he is. Irrelevant. <laughs> that, that is irrelevant. <laughs> you don't just wake up one day and just start shaming someone for their lack of sweater puppies. That's just not something you do. <laughs> I, I find him very sympathetic. He is also kind of a narcissist. Let's be he, real. Here. He is a narcissist. He is one hundred percent. But anyway, god damn it, if he doesn't get anyway, one of the more, yeah, as you're saying, <laughs> Mitsuba is an apparition. We meet half a ghost, I should say, actually halfway through the show, uh, thanks to Ko, and <laughs> he's actually a student who passed away several months prior to the start of the show, and. Um, he, Ko actually knew him for a hot minute. So Ko actually tried to get Mitsuba to, like, fulfill anything he's regretted so he can move on peacefully. Um, however, uh, Tsukasa fucks shit up. Um, and essentially, Mitsuba becomes an apparition thanks to twisted rumors called the Broken Neck Boy. Uh, he dies at the hands of Hanako, essentially. However, oh my god, and this is why we're talking about him more up here. Originally, the plan was talking about him with the um, two other uh, wonders from earlier. <laughs> Mitsuba actually comes back, and then with Tsukasa's help, I say help, but it's more like persistence. Aggressive persuasion. Aggressive persistence. 
Mitsuba becomes the new third wonder out of the seven, the Hell of Mirrors. So, voicing these two characters, as Mitsuba, we have Kyle Ignacy, who has voiced characters such as Kaudu Hanasaki in Cheer Boys, Spearman in Goblin Slayer, and Hirato, ya Hirako, Hirato Yasaki in My Remain as a Cat. As for Ko Minamoto, we have Tyson Reinhardt, who has played characters such as Hifumi Yamada in Daigon Rapa the Animation, Shinya Ozaki in Hinamaru Sumo, and Lava Lee in Rage of Bahamut Genesis. Let us start with... How about we start with Andrew? Okay, okay, you're throwing me at this. Cool. Um, yeah, have fun. So, I'll start off and say... I'm pretty... I'm pretty... Like, I've heard Kyle in a couple of things at this point. Mm -hmm. The thing that drove me wild about his character in uh, Han Han Hanukkah-kun... Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of a show called Epithet Erased? Heard of I've it? Haven't heard of seen it, it? Haven't seen uh, it? I know the title. Basically, one of the central characters of it is played by Kyle Ignacy. Oh, okay. And Good. The same voice he uses for his character in Epithet Erased is almost beat for beat, like the same, the same tone of voice, especially when he goes really high pitched and screams and says, Oh, you're you're gonna use you're gonna use and abuse a defenseless little ghost by me. I'm not here for your sick perverted fantasies. I don't wanna be <laughs> your porn. I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude <laughs> So I will straight up say that this dude is Kyle is insane as this character. <laughs> Insane yep. is that it is as like dramatic a mood whiplash in this show as it gets. Yep. I think Kyle is doing a great job. He does these amazing bitchy piss baby screams. Bitchy piss baby. Oh my god. That's one way, That's to, describe one way it. to describe him. But also like does a pretty good job making the whole like dramatic I I did I want people to remember me and I don't want to die mm -hmm. and be forgotten. It's like I do feel for him. I do sympathize for him. I do completely understand him. Mhm. Mm I don't know if I like this character. It's just fair. It's hard to say. I think that episode 8, which was a really dramatic turn of events, was extremely look here let's not sugarcoat it episode eight was a gut punch. it was a gut punch and i a, think it a was, literal gut it was a gut punch yes and i think it was extremely effective at doing what it needed to mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. the stuff it did with his character after the fact i'm not sure how i'm feeling okay i mean that's fair because for a little extra context so even though Mitsuba dies. Sukasa managed to snag a bit of Mitsuba's soul uh, when he did the literal gut punch. Um, and then he basically created an apparition bit, uh, of lesser, like, weaker spirits, gave part of Mitsuba's soul to it, and basically created an apparition Mitsuba who does not remember anything. He basically created the ghost version of a, pe of a Frankenstein's monster. Pretty much. Like, it's a fucking mess. And it's even worse when he literally takes, like, a wonder's heart and basically stuffs it inside of the homunculus soul. So then he just becomes this sort of fake ghost Frankenstein's monster that's also kind of like a ghost <laughs> chicken man. <laughs> like, he's a... You're not wrong. He's a fucking disaster <laughs> aesthetically. And he... He is. Yeah. L Lilac, I know you've seen Welcome to the NHK, right? It's been a long time, but yes. Okay, there's this one scene where the, the nerd character of the show is like uh, mm -hmm. pirating anime tropes. And he's like, okay, so here's our main character. She's your classmate and childhood friend who also has lifts next door. She's also a robot, but not just any robot, a maid robot. Yep, it's like, yep, <laughs> that's, what yep. the, that's what this sounds yep. like. That's that's exactly what this sounds like. You're 100% correct. The other thing I'm not Okay, I'll, I'll say this is in far of the, the last arc. Mm -hmm. This show needs to commit what the fuck they want to do with Mitsuba. And the entirety of that conflict in episode 11 felt like 
What the fuck do you want me to think about Mitsuba? See, I'm mm. I'm interested in reading the manga on this one. Um because like, again, manga order has it a little bit out uh, of whack and the whole Hell of Mirrors actually comes much later I, in the story. So I'm very curious like, too what they did with Like Mitsuba I'm almost thinking the, like Mitsu like here's the thing, Mitsuba was always going to come back and become a character. And it's like I don't mm -hmm. mind that. I don't mind that. I actually mm -hmm. even kind of like his development of being a, a forced wonder experiment that he agrees to go mm -hmm. with so that he could continue to exist. Right. Do you could, but pick a lane. Pick a lane. It feels like it really feels like his introduction was not meant to develop a character who would be sympathetic. It feels like he was meant to actually develop Ko's character even more. Because at that point, Ko hadn't really had, like, a winning personality. He was yeah. he was yeah. the, the that puppet was, that doll. That was the big with, thing with which it. 100% is developing I will get more Ko. to Ko in a second, but it's like, are you, are you a sympathetic? Are you antagonistic? Are you neutral? Mm -hmm. Are you baby ghost piss baby boy? <laughs> I, 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 these feel like season two questions. These feel like season two <laughs> questions. These are season two questions, but I think possibly, at the very least, I would say neutral. I, I'll go I'll, neutral slash trying to survive. I'll go with at neutral, but it's like I want, feel like the show wants me to like him, but he's also too much of a bitch, and he's also just. Okay, do okay. Can can this show? Fuck you! I like me too. Okay, okay, I love me too. And, and to I me, do like me too. But I feel like that final arc went a little too hard on like the annoying things about me too. for me. Are you, Andrew, are you done with me too? And can you shift to Tyson? Yes. Or uh, Kyle Ignacy okay. does a very good job at me too. It's but I'm just very conflicted on me too as a character. That's that's fair. Tyson Reinhardt. That's fair. This took a while to grow on me. Okay. This took a minute to grow on me because I've heard Tyson's voice. It's pretty deep and gravelly. Mm -hmm. I did not expect Tyson Reinhardt's voice to come out of this character design. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it, like, at first it kind of sounded like he was straining a little. Okay. He grows into it pretty nicely and, I, and he actually does get into the character pretty well, but it was pretty rough for me at the start. I won't, I won't okay. lie. But I That's think fair. he really grows into it and actually does a good job at making me like Ko as a character. And I do enjoy a lot of his quips with Hanako and all the little things he says at him. And I do think he does a really convincing job conveying his friendship and relationship with Mituba and like the emotional tensions especially when he's like legitimately heartbroken and angry and upset and hurt like I was mm -hmm. he sold me on that drama really hard and I was pretty impressed like this took a while to grow on me but I think legit him as Ko was pretty impressed actually won me over surprisingly but it, it took it took a minute or two to get there for me but I think he's got some okay. really funny quips, some really fun character interactions, and some pretty decent character development, too. I will give him that. But Tyson, I definitely liked. It took a while to get there, but I did like it. So sorry I went so hard. I just... I, I really no. didn't know what the show wanted me to feel about Mitsuba, and that's, like, the biggest thing I didn't like okay. about the show. Okay, I mean that that that's that's one hundred percent fair because oh my god, it kind of went. You are right. And the hell of mirrors did go all over the place with him. Now, to be fair, that is completely a critique of the way the show was written. Nothing yeah. to do with Kyle's performance. Of course, right? of course. Uh, like legit. Like yeah. I think, I think his performance no. is great. He sells everything that Mitsuba's putting down. I just, it's just the character's a little whacked out right now. <laughs> so, it... Amon, would you like to add your thoughts into the mix? Uh, let's see. <laughs> Good thoughts, sir. Good thoughts. Kyle's very entertaining Mitsuba is <laughs> comically high strung. Oh, extreme, so high strung. extreme, extremely poorly adapted to be a ghost. <laughs> I, I am, I am curious to see what his arc is that... going forward because if I was going yeah. to make someone a wonder at this school, it would not be this man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he is clearly not cut out for it. No, and he's I, just he's just here at this point. Basically, he just he's just. There wasn't an audition process. 
Although I will, I will say his his insistence that people are going to take advantage of him seems very forced. I think he is hoping that will happen. He seems he yeah. seems to be the kind of guy that like take pride in the fact that guys think he's hot. There, there's, there's, there's even there's a, it's there's kind a, of funny. There's a the lady doth protest too much quality to the whole thing. I mean, there's even cannot help but see. There's a, one of the end uh, end credit manga uh, gag things was uh, 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 I think it was uh, they were asking his character. Did you like any girls while you were alive? And he says very coyly, "Well, I'm actually cuter than any girl at this school." Because his That's character design right. is is very femininely designed. Which, yes. which to he has feminine. He he does a feminine. Which to go into too. a fair bit of the drama, like that was like one of the big reasons, like why he was bullied, like at the start of his life. Yes. That he was very effeminate Certainly. and not true to himself, which is good right. drama. The show also does play that for comedic effect and. You know. Anyway, um, on continue. Kyle's just very entertaining. He is he is the appropriate level of screechy. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, he he is very mean to Dene, but he is he has a lot of zest in his meanness. <laughs> There's he's a ter he's a very not he's a very bad boy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um. It's, uh, and I like Tyson a lot as Ko. I thought he, excuse me, uh, I, don't, I thought he just played the character very well. Like I, I, I think Noah brought this up earlier. He is very much like your your standard third wheel, but I feel like he gets a lot mm -hmm. more in depth to. I, I, I think Noah might be onto something. He feels like he was the guy who was the villain in like the pilot manga that was just a one off. And then they it's were like, possible. and then I was like, oh, yeah, I like this dynamic too much. I'm just gonna make him a main character. I'm gonna make someone else the villain. It's <laughs> you, possible not you worded. You like know who that. Ko feels like to me? Oh God, who? Kuabara. Who? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, his, his, he doesn't yeah, have that yeah. excellent voice, but you're not. There's sure. something <laughs> about the way he talks and the way he like carries like himself with his antagonist. With his friendly you know? antagonism to Hanako. You know? it feels I'm not gonna let you take the name, Hanako. Now that you fucking say it, I can't unsee it. Oh, fuck you. Fuck you, Andrew. Uh, time and place, I mean, sweetie. Time and place. Okay. <laughs> I took a drink of my... <laughs> oh, Andrew, why? <sighs> why must you do this to me all the time? Does anyone remember Dignity? Nope. <laughs> nope. That's a cologne, right? <laughs> Probably, and, yes, actually. Anyway, uh, I'll continue. Yeah, Tyson, I, Tyson's just, he's, he's, he's got a lot of just pep to him, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ko, Ko's, got, Ko's got a lot of, a lot he's trying to prove, and I think Tyson uh, brings out that part of the character really well. Uh, and, I don't know, he's, he's this weird, like, kind of a ridiculous, almost juvenile delinquent thing, now that I think mm -hmm. about it. But he's also an exorcist. He carries around one of those like Shinto or whatever priest staffs that you always see in these kind of supernatural dramas. Uh, and he's horrible at using it. <laughs> he's not. He's trying his best, but he's you know, doing his best. When your, average, when your average is 0. 0.5. <laughs> yup. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, Tyson, I think Tyson just. He plays the character very well. His, his zings are very good. I think they're very well done. He does a good job of, I'm sure a lot of these were probably scripted, but he, he does, he's good at making them feel very off the cuff. Mm. Like, Ko, like Ko has spent time thinking up a few of these, but some of them are just kind of like, yeah, what's something mean I can say about this toilet ghost? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I see it, yep. Yeah, he is a turd. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> he's a pull turd, guys. Ha <laughs> 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 Zing! Uh... <laughs> I, I, and and I, I, I like his his episode with uh, Mitsubu, but I think it's just well done in terms of taking this very mm -hmm. outrageous scenario and getting like good drama out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's a nice turn, I think. Um, yeah, no, just good, like good strong performance. I liked him a lot. I thought he held as well. I thought he held up well against the other two leads, even though he doesn't get quite as much focus. Uh, and he's just very funny throughout. He he does a lot of the comedy really really well, which I appreciate. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll jump in on here. I'll start with Kyle. Because watching Kyle Ignacy grow as a voice actor is so much fun to watch. I remember when he first popped up in a major role with Kado, the, the oh, rancer. Oh, yeah. The, uh, 
the squ the square show. <laughs> the <laughs> the square show where Jason Lebrecht is this weird ass entity. <laughs> it's the best Jason Lebrecht role he's ever played. I'm sorry. I will I will not Fuck apologize you. for that. It's, oh no, it's Yato. Fuck you. Fight me. Um. I, anyway. Mm. <laughs> I like Yato, all right? We need more Noragami in our lives. Season anyway, 3, please and thank um, you. Please and thank you. We need Clifford Chapin to be a horrible shit shit human being now. <laughs> love you, Cliff. <laughs> that, that, we love but you. We're all, but we're already getting My Hero Academia Season 5. Not what I meant, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. God. Anyway, Kyle... Like watching him develop as as a, as a voice actor and growing into more and more major roles um, is so much fun to watch. I love it. Um, in terms of, which makes me very sad that, and I'm hoping and praying someday, someday, we get that Umineko game dub where he's Battler, and I I want that so fucking oh, bad. Oh yeah, that is supposed to happen. Shit. That's supposed to happen. We haven't heard anything for like a long time and I'm sad. I hope things work out and we don't lose this because I will throw money at that Kickstarter. Damn it. I want to hear this. I want to hear fucking Battler go to bat against Beatrice. Let's go. <laughs> um. Anyway, minor tangent. Uh, Kyle is Mitsuba. Oh my sweet baby Jesus. <laughs> Mitsuba is full on aggressive and blunt and just spastic and like holy hell he's all over the place he Mitsuba is all over the goddamn place in terms of energy in terms of personality in terms of mannerisms oh my god <laughs> it's like there are moments where you, <laughs> Kyle probably has, like, whiplash going from those huge, aggressive, spastic moments to this, like, a bit softer, kind of solemn, somber, like, quieter moments that Mitsuba does have. <laughs> and it's like, oh my god, this is the same character, right? Um, I think Kyle does wonderfully with Mitsuba's character. Um, everything with episode 8 between him and Tyson, oh my god, I hurt. <laughs> I hurt so much during that whole ep that episode. I was just like, oh, this is a literal gut punch to me right now. Um, and then everything after the fact when Mitsuba comes back during Hell of Mirrors, it's it's very interesting. Again, and I will ag now that Andrew has said it, I will agree with him. I don't know where the hell they're gonna go with his character, but that's more on the story and the show. He itself. joined the evil tea party. That's quote unquote joined because we don't know if he's gonna stay around there he did help get Nene and the others out of there before Sukasa tries to do anything else um but you can tell that Mitsuba still has his struggles and his own insecurities even though he doesn't remember um who he was when he was alive um and it's gonna be very interesting his dynamic with Tyson if there if we get a continuation and seeing how their relationship develops um tyson as co oh my god um similar to andrew it did take me a tiny bit to adjust to in the beginning but <laughs> he won me over very quickly actually with with co because you don't normally hear tyson perform these kinds of characters and Tyson just straight up has a ball with it. It's so, it's so energetic and, it, oh, what the fur my nose. He's energetic, he's fun, he's very naive. 100% Ko is naive to everything. Um, but I think what really, really, he got me, he, he, I was sold very quickly, but r what really sold me, 100%, and made me, like, go of the opinion of, this is an undercover MVP of the show. Tyson is 100% the undercover MVP of the show. Is episode 8, and in particular, when Mitsuba basically is just basically on his last leg, and before Hanako stabbed him... That whole exchange with Tyson and Hanako, I was tearing up. And then it kept going because after the fact, 
one thing we didn't mention, Mitsuba was in the photography club and he liked taking pictures. His, um, he took some pictures as possibly one of the things he regretted before passing on. Ko developed the photos that Mitsuba had taken that day. And one of those photos happened to be of Ko. That whole, ex that whole scene with the monologue and everything and him discovering the photo, that hurt. That was another literal gut punch to me. And I was sold every second during the last half of that episode by Tyson. So this is... Tyson is legit the, like, underdog, undercover MVP of the show, 100% to me. This is so different than what I'm used to for Tyson, and he just, outside of the early parts of the show, he fucking nails the aspects of Ko's character and is growing with it, and I absolutely 100% love it. Noah. Yeah. I believe we need your thoughts on these performances. Uh, actually, you guys covered all the bases. In fact, I have a bingo card right here. That is, uh, you know, I had uh, different, I had 25 squares Sorry. for uh, Tyson and 25 for, uh, yeah, 25 for Tyson and 25 for Kyle. And you guys actually hit up all of them. I actually said bingo quite a few times while you guys were talking. <laughs> anyway. anyway. But uh, to, uh, to give uh, agreeance, especially about Tyson's uh, voice, not mm -hmm. matching the character design. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely true. That, I wrote yes. that down as like my number one note was the design doesn't match. But again, it, I was endeared to it. There's um, it, this wasn't like uh, um, uh, who am I thinking of? Um, you're um, the who's the lead guy from Yuri on Ice? Not Yuri himself, but his coach. I'm Victor blanking here. Kiverov. Victor. Thank you. It wasn't like a Victor's Russian accent kind of thing where. Like, uh, it, it took a really long time to get into. It was actually, mm. like, it was not that tough to do. And it helped that his archetype, Koi's archetype, is, again, the third wheel kind of character we see in a lot of mm. anime. But unlike things like Fire Force, where uh, you had a character like Arthur, who I never was endeared to, Ko got a lot <laughs> more fun. Arthur's a dumbass. He Sorry. is a dumbass. Arthur's a stupid idiot. He is, but and but I never liked him. Like, sometimes I like the the helpless dumbasses. I never liked mm -hmm. Arthur, because he was too full of himself. Ko Fair. is not, and it helps that he has two great dynamics. He has, he's a younger brother, so uh, his relationship with Teru really endears him to being, like, uh, not as hard-nosed as Teru does, and mm -hmm. that makes us feel a little bit more for him. Like, yes, we want to root for the younger, uh, more emotional character compared to his more hard-nosed brother. And then we get the the whole thing with Mitsubo, with Mitsuba, which I feel like it would have been a strong he would have been a stronger character if yeah they had cut out uh, his er initial introduction where he's screeching about you're just gonna put me in porn, uh, which is funny I'm sure, but doesn't really endear us to the character all that much. That being said, Tyson's entire performance is again it's very well done, and if you can get over the dissonance between clearly full-grown adult voicing high school looking character, I don't think that anyone else listening will have a problem with it, because he's a great actor, and that's all that really matters. And same with Kyle, too. His entire uh, shtick is uh, kind of like the spirits we were actually talking about. Oh, he is a spirit, actually. No, it fits in. That's the theme. That is the theme with all of the Seven Wonders, is that they all have incredible range. Yep. We had Alexis's... That is 100% true. Yeah, we had Yoko, who was very... Yakko, sorry, Yoko is a different show. Yakko, who, you know, shifted from Sultry to Babby. We had... Uh, Wacko. Suchikamori. <laughs> we had Wacko, <laughs> who is... <laughs> That show's coming back, by the way. I'm hyped as hell for that. I, oh my god! We I are going to do that be. episode. Look, look forward to that, people. Next year we will do <laughs> Dub Talk Animaniacs 2020. Su Suchi Gamori is the one you want. Thank you. But yeah, he, yeah, shift on there from his goofier voice to his lower voice, and then we have this entire role right here, where Kyle really does sell the dramatic portions of it, and uh, I, I, I feel almost manipulated that they. Uh, they set up the character to be as empathetic as possible that mm -hmm. I died and no one remembers me. And then it's like, okay, so as soon as we hear that, you could almost see the timer at the bottom of the screen counting down to his imminent death. Because you just know, you just know hearing that, that his days, his minutes on screen are numbered. And lo and behold, they were. He's only two days away from retirement, too. He was! <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I almost wish they had put that. They had almost put that down there. So th these two characters are a fun bunch to listen to. Exactly what these three guys just said. Okay. Um. Oh boy, we gotta we gotta speed this along. We have our last two characters. Y'all ready Yay. for this? Mm -hmm. Y'all ready for this? <sighs> I knew the second I said that I was gonna regret it. Um, all right. So we have our two lead characters. We have Hanako, uh, uh, or Wonder Number Seven, Hanako the bath bathroom ghost, also known in his previous life as Amane Yugi. Uh, and we have Nene Yashiro. Uh, <laughs> Hanako is the seventh wonder of the wonders. He's in charge of them. He's trying to make sure shit doesn't go crazy. <laughs> but he's also a silly little gremlin child <laughs> at the same time. Nene Yashiro is Hanako's assistant um, by her own stupidity, basically. <laughs> Um, that's the short, that's the short TLDR version of how this relationship came to be. Um, she also, be, one of the big points in the show is, um, very first episode. She swallows a mermaid scale, and if she comes in contact with water, she can turn into a fish because of it, because she is now cursed. I um, wish, I wish I was a fish. <laughs> Nene doesn't wish she was a fish anymore. Um. She wishes she was part of that world. To which, because the fish scales are matchmaking items, um, Hanako, in order to help split the curse um, for Nene and keep her from being a fish forever, uh, he takes he, he consumes the other scale, and basically they are now bound together. Uh, so, voicing these characters as... I'm going to start with Nene. Nene Yashido is voiced by Tia Ballard, who has voiced characters such as Aligula from Blood Black K Battlefront, Kagura Soma in the reboot of Fruits Basket, and Nanami Momozano in Kamisama Kiss. And as for... Oh, boy. As for Hanako, we have Justin Briner, who has voiced characters such as Finnis in Code Realized, Guardian of Rebirth, Nasu no Yoichi in Drifters, and everybody's favorite fucking character and performance in the entire known world, Mikaela Hiyakia and Seraph of the End. <laughs> because, of course, I go there instead of the obvious answer. Everybody um, knows already. Let's... We, we can play the card we do Justin Brighter before he was cool. That's a thing our podcast can do. Fuck yeah, and he's a sweetheart. Uh, anyway, let's start with... I'm gonna start... How about we start with Amon this time? What are your thoughts on these performances? They're great. <laughs> they good. <laughs> it good. We're back to it good. <laughs> We've gone full circle. <laughs> there are two pull quotes on the back of the, uh, of the cart. One just says, it good, dub talk podcast. If one says it good, also dub talk podcast. No, 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 no. It no, good, no. that good. I, 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 no, I don't want to say it good dub talk podcast. I want to say it good some random hipster in Boston who is cooler than you. I am not a hipster <laughs> and I'm not cooler than anyone. You're cool for, You're cool to us, though. It's fine. It's very flattering. <laughs> Anyways, um, let me start. Tia's just very sweet. Nene's trying so hard. <laughs> Nene is a disaster not, bitch. He's doing your best. For any of this, she would rather be doing <laughs> typical teen girl things like you crushing can't, on boys. Okay, okay, you or, cannot say she asked for any of this. She brought it upon herself. Yeah, but she didn't but think she it was good. She didn't want any of it. No, no. Yes. She, like, like also, she did, there's, a, there's a difference yeah. between saying Bloody Mary three times in the mirror and Bloody Mary <laughs> showing up. Let's 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 get it straight. <laughs> not wrong. Like she, she's not the fucking craft. Okay. <laughs> She weren't trying to summon demons. She was just she was just falling around with ghost storks, oh and unfortunately, she lives in a world where that's true. And she found that out the hard way. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, she would rather be just playing her phone game and being an idol manager. But sadly, <laughs> she she's a ghost assistant because, like you do, and she turns into a fish. <laughs> like you do. For, not for, apparently, Rumiko Takahashi's coming back in more than one way these days. Ooh. <laughs> Oh, it's a deep, it's a deep cut for you old people out there. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> uh, Tia, Tia, Tia just does a wonderful job. Nene is just she's a real sweetheart. She's doing her best amongst all this insanity and stupidity. Uh, she's just, she's just. 
I don't she's just, she's very charming. She's trying really hard. And the ghosts she deals with are just the most ridiculous things in the world. Like the tree. The the the, <laughs> the, the confession tree? Yeah, exactly. The uh, what is it? The was it the mo the momo what do they call them? the rabbit things? Uh, okay. Oh, I'm okay. Yeah, just the the real the real the stars of the show. The mo. The mo <laughs> yes, one hundred percent the true star of Toilet Bound Hanako Kun. The mo Extreme. Her her little bit of coming up with a new rumor so that they didn't have to be weird monsters all the time was just so adorable. I just like it you're was. very nice. It's so you just, cute. You just want to help people. Tia, just give just give them candy and they'll leave you alone. <laughs> exactly. Now, Tia, I think Tia just really nails the like awkward clumsiness of the character and also just her innate sweetness, how, you know, she's probably doesn't want to be here, but this is this is what's going on now, so she's gonna try her best and persevere. Uh, and she's just very adorable. Mm-hmm. Justin, I I, I am deeply amused by the the weird contrast of Justin that his two the two types of characters he seems to get cast as are Deku, mm -hmm. you know, nice boys, and uh, raving lunatics like Luck from Black Clover. Yeah, one hundred percent. And and Hanako's kind of in the middle of that where he he's not a lunatic he's more of just a troll he does have nice points uh, but he's perfectly happy to like hassle and tease people for his own amusement because he's a ghost and that's what ghosts do. Uh, I really like him as Hanako. I think this is very much the kind of character he excels at. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it lets him amp up a little bit. He can be very funny. Uh, he's also just a strong actor, so when, say, he runs into Tsukasa, you know, mm, 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 I don't want to be here right now. This isn't fun. No anymore. one wants to be here right now with Tsukasa in the room. Run away, child. Exactly. I especially like the little flashback where back when he was alive when he was talking to him. Mm. Uh, Suchigamori and he's kind of talking about what he would do. Uh, it's just it's just a very sweet moment, uh, and I feel like you know you know Justin. I think you know between playing shonen heroes and so on, I think it sometimes gets a little overlooked that he is a good actor. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought that was just a very nice example of that. Um, he's in, like Hanako is one of those characters who has a lot of range in his character that I think could trip up an actor if it's not handled well, and I think Justin handles that very admirably. He was a real blast to listen to, just all mm -hmm. the way through. Okay. Uh, Noah? Uh, I mean, I, I would like to say, like, um, you know, something critical here, something to offer Justin and Tia who are listening to this and say, like, here's what I think you should work on. And unfortunately, I can't do that because <laughs> this is clearly um, two very seasoned, very professional, and very having fun actors who brought their A-game to this performance. Uh, starting with Tia, especially, because um, it's very rare, I feel like, to have a lead female character in an anime, especially these days, who is... I suppose, uh, covers the range of being both feminine while also being kind of loony at the same time. I, I feel like the last time we really got that was uh, the main girl from Gachamon Crowds, whose name I'm blanking on. Um, and that uh, dynamic that... Thank you. I'm sorry. It's, it's been a hot minute since I've seen the show, but you know exactly who I'm talking about. But I, I feel like Tia's... Because the thing about uh, Nene's performance is that she was supposed to be trying to become more feminine and delicate. And she even mm. shouts at one point, I'm feminine and delicate! She says as she's like swinging an axe at the ground of the, of the yeah. garden club. Yeah, like a hatchet or some shit, like garden it, yep. Yeah, yeah. So that, <laughs> but again, it, it, she is really multidimensional because not only does she uh, portray different characteristics, but they all fit. They, they don't feel mm -hmm. out of place. Like when she gets scared when they go into the spirit world, that fits. When she gets... Um, uh, not happy-go-lucky, um, dedicated to helping out the, um, what are they called, the, the Mokai um, at the same time. That also doesn't feel out of place for her. And Tia voices all of those parts really well. She's got, like, this very um, sweet-sounding voice most of the time. It pitches up when she gets freaked out. And she's also got um, a lot of downtrodden parts, too. Like, she's kind of lamenting about the sadder things that are going on and about... Yeah, you know, just like, I really wish I could uh, help out Hanako, or she's like thinking about how his life ended up and how he, she kind of wants to be more of a friend to him halfway through the series. Like, that's the part I think that's going to endear people more to the show, and that's probably why a lot of people were recommending the show, and I'm going to recommend it too now, is because it's a dynamicism that is easy to laugh at, but it also tugs at your heartstrings in the good ways when it really wants to. 
And speaking of tucking out those heartstrings, because this character doesn't have a heart anymore because he's dead, Hanako <laughs> is a lot of fun because he's not... I don't think he's mean-spirited. I was actually debating with Lilac on this. I wouldn't call him a gremlin. At least not a shit gremlin. There's a lot of... There's a lot of, like, uh, bad-meaning characters who like to... I mean, he, who get a he, thrill. He's a ghost of the toilet. He kind of is a shit gremlin. Ooh! <laughs> You got me! <laughs> I can't argue with semantics! Ouch! Okay, but in the less literal sense, he is, uh, because he helps out, uh, his friends, well, friends, quote-unquote, uh, for, uh, he's not really getting anything out of it, like, he doesn't really get anything out of helping Nene, and he could have easily just let her remain as a fish and given her away to the mermaid, but he doesn't. And that's, that's an admirable quality to have. But I love that Justin Briner has like this, um, uh, he can uh, shift between uh, the different voices. Again, going back to all of the wonders seem to be able to shift their voices really well, convincingly well. Um, I think uh, I, I mentioned already that I loved how his one deepest, darkest fear, his secret that he doesn't want anyone to find out about, is that he really, really <laughs> likes donuts. <laughs> And that's, oh, he's so precious. Yeah, that. so yeah, Justin's good, Tia is good. The, and yeah, we, if we could have a second season of this just for their dynamicism, I'd be interested in seeing that. I'm going to make a small comment, because you said that Hanako doesn't get anything out of doing all this stuff. It's possible he does, actually. Oh? Because um, I think it's the first interaction with Ko, and Ko brings up to Nene that Hanako is in fact a murderer. That's true. And Hanako states that if he does good, then God would forgive his transgressions. Okay, that's... But th that's never... I mean, that is a possibility. He it's literally just, says it's, it's it. A, it's, it's a throwaway... It's, he literally says it. It's a little bit of a throwaway bit. Um, but mm. I'm just saying, he, he does... He, in theory, mm -hmm. probably, he will be getting something out of it. We don't know the full extent of that though it's a bit of a throwaway moment i think okay. but um it but, is stated that it's possible he does get something out of it right but but he's not like panty and stocking where that's clearly his only motivation it's like i'm just doing good stuff to get heaven coins to be let back into heaven yeah again we don't know the details again that's just one little bit okay um fair. that's it's one little bit you could consider a, a throwaway a throwaway moment but yeah. like to make it clear He's clearly try. It seems like he's trying to redeem himself for murdering his younger brother, quote unquote. Um, Andrew, your thoughts on these performances? Nene, Nene, sweetie, baby doll, <laughs> you deserve darling, you disaster, bitch, darling, darling, darling. Holy shit, girl! <laughs> like. Hey, the world needs to be nicer about you, about your legs. You're beautiful the way you are. B, sweetie, holy fuck. <laughs> like, you're not, look, you're not at a 10, but you're at a eight at least, and you need to bring it down to maybe a five. <laughs> she's, look, she's not know. reaching into the, she's not going through their brush to get the hair level obsessed but she is writing her own personal diary fan fiction of her boy she likes that's that's well, not the, exactly the very on least. the okay level no the, it's not at the very least she's not so, she's not publishing it on the internet with the name swapped around uh. <clears throat> she, she's not submitting fan fiction with the serial numbers filed off She's Anyways. just keeping it in her private book. Point being. Point. Anyway, aside from your disaster bitch tangent. Okay. Um, God, Tia is very... She is so funny. She is so, so funny. She is just squealing and screaming. And, like, it doesn't really come off as, like, annoying or too high pitch. It's just, like, the right level of exacerbated and just goofy. She also changes up her tone enough that, like, when she does escalate it, it really gets some good laughs. Like, 
when she's talking about the fact that she's in the gardening club and it's like, hey, I'm pretty, I'm fancy, I'm like dainty and delicate. And she just raises it to an extreme aggressive leg and that just cracks me the fuck up. She's just this very goofy disaster. I love the stupid little poem she gets about like her secret, like, oh no, Hanako's actually kind of hot. It was so uh, cute. She, she is a disaster, but Tia's got the whole spectrum of goofy, crazy, but also kind of sweet, heart-trodden little girl who's trying her best. I do like when she gets emotional and she kind of gets sincere. I love when she, like, opens up about being upset that Hanako kind of used her confession. And then just, like, yep. him genuinely apologizing and just that little moment where she's like... I want to know so much about him, and the fact that I don't makes me upset, and I don't know why, and it's like, oh, that's really cute. Like, they are, it really gives me a major, like, Noragami vibe with their relationship in regards to, Ooh. uh, like, in A, the tone of the show is very Noragami, but also their relationship dynamic in particular gives me major Noragami vibes, but kind of similar to um hikari and yato mm -hmm. right Hi hiori okay. i think hiori excuse me yep you're right hiori mm -hmm. and yato but yeah no i think tia's just got a great range and she's she's doing some really fun stuff with nene she's got some quirky expletives and fun mouth noises that she makes she is just she's a disaster and justin briner is just he's a talented son bitch <laughs> like, I, I I will I will just flat out and say Megami Ogata is one of my favorite Japanese seiyus. Period. And it's always a tall order to try and follow up with a performance that she's done. But fucking Justin pulls it off. He does it. He does it yep. good. He's got the rage of chaos. He's got the goofy. He's got the goofy stuff. He's got some really quirky line de deliveries where he's kind of sque squealing, screamy, like Luck or, oh god, what's this guy from Doctor Stone? Um, Ginro, where he's just kind of squealing, like yay, ha, blood, what's up, ha, ha, kind of like a kind of like a high pitched Mickey Mouse, but then he's got that sort of like sadistic chaos voice where he's like. Oh, oh, you don't want to mess with him. Come near me and I cut you. But also he's just kind of a little playful. But also he's there and sincere and emotional and compelling drama. Like the stuff when he's Yuki. The stuff when he's vulnerable and showing himself to Nene. It's... Like there's a whole emotional... I feel like we almost take for granted how talented a performer Justin Briner really is. Because there are times where it's like, you think you are you know what he's capable of. And this is, okay, look. This is probably a character that you would assume and associate he could do. But he still does the whole nine yards and then some. And that's commendable and really admirable. Like, I know everybody kind of used to how good he is because he's Deku. But, like, mm -hmm. he's got a whole catalog of strong oh, yeah. performances not everyone's like not everyone is like the best there's ever been but like he's got a he's got a talented resume at this point he's he's built himself he's built himself he's built himself up as a uh as a tour de force in the dallas spear for good reason mm -hmm. and he's he's given his all and having a having a blast as hanako like I, I very much enjoyed this. Nice. Okay. Mm. I believe that leaves me, correct? Uh, Unless there's with... a ghost in the chat. Ooh. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to start with Tia as Nene. Um, Tia is such a sweet and adorable disaster bitch. <laughs> Nene is a disaster, but we all love her and are rooting for her, even though half of the shit that happens to her is of her own fucking design and stupidity. <laughs> like, she's just... She, it just happens. Um, You want to know what um, Nene slightly reminds me of in terms of 
character and personality to a point. Mm -hmm. She reminds me of Nanami from Kamisama Kiss. Um, because Nanami is at least semi-similar in terms of personality. Granted, Nanami is not as gung-ho about wanting a boyfriend <laughs> as Nene is. Um, but she, Nene is also just similar to Nanami, is just very sweet, very endearing, very, very cute and charming, and yet she's also very determined, and she seems at least at first, unaware of her own surroundings and her own impact um, in Hanako's life. But the more she dives deeper into this and the more she gets herself involved in everything, she wants to know more. And I think that's something I really love about Nene as a character. And I think Tia portrays that very, very well. Like, she knows how to be the energetic naive like oh my gosh this boy he's gonna ask me out na, 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 na. but she also knows how to subdue it to bring it down a notch and to like really reflect on the things going on around her and i really love tia and her portrayal of nini because of that now when i call hanako a shit gremlin i don't mean as like an evil little bastard <laughs> um when i call Hanako a shit gremlin. He is mischievous, he is playful, he is energetic, he he's chaotic good. <laughs> Hanako is chaotic good. <laughs> 100%. Because he's trying to protect both the spirit world as well as the human realm from all of these bad apparitions because rumors are getting twisted around. But Hanako also just likes to have fun. <laughs> because from what we can tell, as far as what we know of in the show and what we know of, Hanako has never had a friend in his goddamn life. He, he gives a girl Whether... a, a Kakeshi doll and then mm. says, it's kinda sexy. And she chucks it out yes. the fucking window. He's just like, no! <laughs> <coughs> Hanako probably has never had friends, whether he was alive or dead until this point. He does not quite understand social norms and social protocol. Again, the Kakeshi doll being a huge point. But he's also a little bit jokester and a prankster, and he's so much fun. He's also straight up caressing her in her class. It's like, even if, if they can't see her, it's like, bro. You, bro, you, you're, you save that for, like, the back of the school or something at, like, 6 o'clock. Un no, under the bleachers, dude. <laughs> under the bleachers. <laughs> Under the bleachers. I'm not wrong. It's a ghost job. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, anyway. Anyway, bringing it back in. Um, Hanako is just all over the place as a character. So trying to portray a character that is all over the place, whether it is... Whether it's trying to figure out if this is his actual personality or not, because you can kind of make the argument that some of his hyperactive moments, you can't say if that's who Hanako really is. It's hard to pin down who Hanako is as a person, because he's all over the place. And because he's all over the place, <laughs> Justin gets to go all over the place. <laughs> he gets to play with his range. I think the comparison of him being a mix of, like, in the middle of good boys like Deku and absolute crazy characters like Luck and Black Clover, I think that's a good compromise. It's a mix of the two. Um, and Justin just, oh my god, I was sold from the start of episode one, and I just could not stop watching this man portray this crazy-ass character. And... Uh, he just nails every aspect of the character, whether it's that mischievous, crazy side, whether it's the stupid, flirty, who does not understand social norms side. But he also nails the real darker moments, too. Not just the serious moments where Hanako has to assume the role of the seventh wonder and the one who oversees and takes care of everybody else, but when he's Amine Yugi. And we start learning bits and pieces about his past life. 
and clearly he's being abused by someone we don't know who. The implication might be Sukasa, we don't know. And knowing he murdered his brother, and also we don't know how he died. There are details about Amine Yugi as a person we do not know. But when he's Yugi Amine, Amine Yugi, it's more subdued and kind of like downtrodden and maybe even depressed at some points because Amine just doesn't want to do anything anymore. He really doesn't. And the scene with Tsuchigamori in the flashback is very prevalent of that characteristic and personality of Amine. Um, there's just so much to Hanako as a character. And so many layers and pieces of the personality, not pieces of personality, pieces of the puzzle. Hanako is a puzzle. Mm. There are so many pieces to him, and Justin has, I think, meticulously and finally crafted a way to try and solve it and put the pieces together to figure out who Hanako is as a character and how he should sound as a in a performance like this. Justin 100% is my favorite performance of the show. <laughs> Hanako is my goddamn son. <laughs> <laughs> this is my son. I call him a shit gremlin, but I don't give a goddamn. This is my son. <laughs> I have anime children up the wazoo at this point. He is my son. <laughs> you, you've heard and that want... show, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. I feel like there needs to be yes. another show called Lilac's Home for Anime, anime Children. children. <laughs> she currently has ten. Hanako is one of them. <laughs> uh, question. Are you, yes. are you done with your thoughts for right now? I, I didn't want to interrupt you before making this next statement. Uh, bottom line, Tia Ballard is sweet and adorable as Nene, even though she is a disaster bitch. And Hanako is a straight up complex puzzle that Justin just seriously, masterfully is putting those pieces together. And I think it's like the, the fruits of his labor speak for themselves 100%. I absolutely love it. I'm good. So what you're saying is Hanako, a.k.a. Amine Yugi, is a complex mm -hmm. puzzle waiting to be solved. Don't you fucking dare making a Millennium Puzzle joke. I will end you. I know that's where you're going. I fucking know that's where you're going. You fuck off. Well, Li Lilac, are you saying that uh, if he does say that, that you're going to duel him? No, 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 she's no. gonna send my ass to the Shadow Futon. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking quit. Y'all are horrible. Awesome. Oh. All right. Amon, you are my only friend now. These two idiots are done. Okay. As, as somebody who knows Amon, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair. Amon's, be Amon's cooler and better anyway. God. Uh <laughs> You're not wrong. You're not wrong. <laughs> no lies detected. All right. Are we good? We've been going at this for a while. Is it time to go to final thoughts and try and finish this fucker? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Let's start. Final thoughts on the English dub of Toyobon Hanako-kun. Let's start with Amon, please. It could. Yes. <laughs> Put that on the yeah. box a third time. <laughs> No, it's well acted, it's well directed, I think it's really funny, I think the cast knocks it out of the park, and this is a great way to watch the show. Do it. Okay. Or don't, I'm not your mother. Or, <laughs> watch it, it's good, or don't, I not your mother. That's the quote. <laughs> Alright, perfect, love it. There's, there's uh, a, I forget, what was that old magazine that said, like, um, don't buy this magazine, or don't, we don't care. It sounds like something Mad would do. Yeah, that, I think it was a Mad That, that really does sound like, God, that's like the Sundari marketing at work. Anyway, anyway, Andrew, your final thoughts on the dub of Hanako. This is a very good, sh this is a very enjoyable show. I can see why this manga definitely got as big as it did and why people really like mm -hmm. it. It's got a nice, it's got a nice supernatural whimsy to it. It's very much if you like ghost stories and like ha haunted tales, but with like a bit of a sh shonen anime flavoring. It's got a nice touch of that. It's also got a really unique aesthetic that I re I really can't say there are any other mm. anime or manga that really look like Hanako Kun, especially like the mm -hmm. direction of it does a really good job selling it as like a very 
motion manga style, which I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of the director's style for doing that in other works. And I think the anime does a solid job adapting the feel of the show. I think the dub is also just... It's a really strong dub. It has some parts that I think were a little rough at the beginning and has a couple of curious choices throughout. But I still think overall the core cast is really solid with a couple of especially impressive performances in particular. Like, my, my still think my standouts are probably uh, Justin, Tia, Kara, and Austin in particular. Um, okay. I had a fun time watching this. I really enjoyed doing this. And I will say, yes, this is a good show. Absolutely give it a watch. This is a show that I don't really know which category to put it in, which makes it uh, a little difficult to recommend to certain people. But mm -hmm. um, I, I can't really think of very many people who wouldn't get something out of this, uh, the particular blend of uh, both humor, horror, and uh, comedy that it mixes together. And the dub cast absolutely went all in on this. And it's more of an accomplishment when uh, you don't really have a prior show or a prior genre to play off of. Because even though there's some tropes in here that you can tie to other anime that have come out, uh, overall the entire package is very much one of a kind. So they, they've kind of crafted out their own uh, style for how to do this kind of show. And not only was it well made in like on the Japanese side of things, like um, Andrew was saying, the actual look of it is incredibly distinct and I think may have actually endeared me to the show more than it probably deserved just because it doesn't look like most shows. But it's also well directed, well written, plenty of fun little quips in there, and yeah, if this does continue into a season two, I don't think I'd object. Like to see like maybe a, a stronger through narrative than just wacky escapades involving a ghost. But you know, for for what they're going for, they're just trying to make this fun and accessible, and they did a good job. Um, the show is so much fun. It's <laughs> legit. It's probably one of my favorites from the year so far, and that's saying a lot. Um, it's such a fun aesthetic, it's a fun story, it's a fun everything for me, uh, and I love it. The dub is fantastic. Aside from little, little rough patches in the beginning, uh, probably in terms of vocal adjustments, it has such fun performances and dynamics throughout the entire course of the show that I can, couldn't help but fall in love with the entire way. <laughs> Uh, I would say my favorite performances of the show from the core cast would be uh, Justin, Austin, and as an underdog MVP kind of favorite, I would say Tyson um, as among my favorite performances of the show. But <laughs> there is just so much, so much, such a big dynamic, such a diverse group of actors playing these really whacked out characters and you and the direction is fun the writing is fun everything about this show is just absolute fun 100 percent so i will say please go watch toilet bound hanako kun it is a joy it is a fun little time uh if anything to at least see batshit crazy gremlin justin briner <laughs> <laughs> uh, just steal every part, just steal every scene he's in, basically. Um, and if you do want to watch Toilet Bound Hanako Kun, you can. It is currently licensed by Funimation, and you can watch the series both in the Japanese and the English on Funimation's website. They do have a 14 day free trial. You can sign up in order to use their premium services to watch the English dub. Otherwise, if your regular warning, though, if you don't want to keep the service uh, by the time the 14 days are up, you got to cancel it because it, when signing up, you it got, does ask for credit card information. It will charge your account. You can also read up on the antics. I'm actually pushing for this too since I'm going to probably start reading it more. Um, you can also read the manga, which is currently licensed by Yen Press as well. I believe the manga in terms of the North American releases, release is up through uh, volume 13. So it's pretty up to date. Um, with Japan's release, actually. Wait, is it? I will, no I will note that's only digital. In print, it's up to, like, four. Okay, that makes... Yeah. Digital-wise, it's up to 13. You that makes correct. more sense. Okay. Um, yep. Um, now, if you want to catch anything that we here at DubTuck do, 
the best ways to do so. If you are currently watching us on YouTube, please subscribe. We would love it. Uh, let us know what you think of the episode in the comments. We would love to hear your, from you. Um, if you are currently listening to us on the go, you can follow us uh, via Podbean, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Please follow us, especially on the audio platforms. As for any social media, if you want to follow us, you can follow us on Twitter at Dubtalk Podcast. We have a Instagram and Tumblr, which are both probably dead at this point, but we also have a Twitch channel also at Dubtalk Podcast. If you want to support us in a completely different way, uh, there are two ways you can. We do have a Ko-fi uh, where you can give little one-time donations if you would like to help support the show. We also have our Patreon uh, if you want to help us in a broader, larger way. Uh, you can support us through Patreon, to which we do have patrons to thank, as we always do. We have our $5 patrons, B. Morris, Michelle Travis, Miraculous Corazon, and Victor Mayborda. And our $10 patrons, Carly Lestacow, Crimson Akinda, uh, Jacob Wilson, J2 aka Jared, Julia W., Marissa Lenti, Nico Robin, but with Yowie Hands, and Otaku Anthony. Without you guys, we probably wouldn't have been able to get the Aristus feed going. I'm Love your faces! <laughs> We love you. We love you very much. Um, for anything and shenanigans that the four of us do, my name is Stephanie. Sometimes I'm also referred to as Lilac. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Lilac Anime Review, with review being spelled R E V U E. I also have a blog, Life and Times WordPress.com, where I sometimes update with shenanigans to which I need to finish my little article about my tenant yes. children, because this is how my life works. <laughs> I'm working on it. Uh, he is Andrew, um, sometimes also known as Classy Spartan. You can follow him on Twitter at Mangaman9000. He also is a co-host on Podcast ONA, along with fellow Dubtug host Jet, and sometimes I pop in on occasion, depending it depends, on where It depends where episodes. I'm recording <laughs> and if Steph's over and or vice versa. Yep, depends. Uh, Noah, also referred to as Noah Clue. You can follow him on Twitter at Noah Clue. He also has a YouTube channel, Journey Traveler, where he is, of course, the anime, uh, animation aficionado. I almost called you anime aficionado. That's incorrect. That, no, no, um, no, no. Cartoons of the entire world, young lady. There is a whole Animation world aficionado. Out there. I, I corrected myself on that. Yes, you did. Uh, <laughs> And he just will create videos regarding different fo different animation mediums around the world. Uh, as for Amon, you can follow him on Twitter at AmonDuelUS. Duel has two U's in it. Um, where you can follow him for fun little niche things that, like spooks and skeletons and, uh, of course, dusty old song. Dusty songs, old song. Perhaps. Dusty old song. Dusty old song. Andrew, okay. shut up. I was going to go with a different one, but then I realized that one's about ghosts, and I can repurpose that later. And when okay. else am I going to talk to a show with an exorcist in it? In 1973, The Exorcist came out. It was a big hit. Notably yes. on it was its use of a, a wonderful piece of score that introduces the music, this creepy little piano and bells da, da, piece. Da, 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 exactly. Da, 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 da. It is a perfect piece, so naturally it has absolutely nothing to do with the movie originally. It's just the first five minutes of the album Tubular Bells by Mike Oldfield. Tubular Bells is great. It is 40 minutes long. There are, there are no vocals aside from a guy listing off instruments and a man making werewolf noises. It is maybe the greatest album ever made. <laughs> that is that. amazing. Like, that already sounds like Ahmad's level of shit. Tubular just oh, little, I do true. look, sometimes I say things exaggeration, but like no, Tubular Bells is one of the greatest albums ever made. You should it's on Spotify, go listen to it. Alright, I think I think our little uh spooky tales have come to an end. Yeah. Uh, the these four wonder these four of the seven wonders, it's, it's time to go to sleep. <laughs> It's time for us to go to sleep and then terrorize more children tomorrow. Yay! It's fine. <laughs> children screams. <laughs> oh god! Make sure to read. So make sure to read the fine print before you summon a demon, ladies. Oh yeah, <laughs> ladies. Uh, that's it for us. Thank you so much for listening or and or watching us. We hope you enjoyed. And until next time, otaku on my friends. Aloha. Rock on Chicago. Rock on Boston. I'm